Yeah, I'll marry to not the. Uh, it, uh, you know, it, it, uh, when you have three little kids at home, you try and uh, not get your wife too angry. Uh, I, I, I try and minimize my uh, my time away, and if one day less. Well, maybe then it's one day more, and the next time I come. So uh, it's a balancing game. Um, okay. Uh, how is everyone good? Yeah. Any questions in preparation for the final? It is the hardest thing you will ever see in your lives, just to, just to be clear. Um, I expect no one to pass. Um, I, 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 I took the exam already, and I got 100 on it. Uh, but, uh, yeah. No, but... Huh? Was this is going to be for you. You did the answer. Exactly. Exactly. So now, everyone will be fine. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, uh, if people want, we can leave a little time at the end of class to talk about uh, uh, the type of problems and, and, and whatnot. But I think it's an exam that's fair, that reflects uh, what we've done in this class up until now, uh, things that we've talked about here. Uh, there's nothing that is uh, going to trick you or anything. So I, I think everyone will be just, uh, just okay. And I'll be here during the exam. If you know, there's any questions about interpretation or anything, uh, I'm happy to, uh, <coughs> to do it, to look at it, right? Good. All right, any last, any other questions about anything? Yes? Yes, like yesterday we discussed defamation. Yes. Okay? There are many an offenses where it's a penal offense and that you, um, <coughs> as well as there's a human rights violation, huh. right? There is this one offense, but it constitutes both. It, in, uh, like it involves both human yeah. violation as well as the kind of office punishment and Yeah. So, in that case, like if the penal code has punished uh, the guilty, okay, but the human rights violation part is not addressed. Yeah. Okay. So, does that leave open the scope of going for the further, uh, you know, conviction or sentence or compensation or whatever for uh, on that scope, on the ground of violation of human rights? Or does it not mean, if we go for it, say, I mean, they have a category, does it not involve a sort of a deal, double jeopardy? Oh, a what? A double jeopardy that is punishing the same person for same offense twice? If you if you prosecute them twice for criminal and for civil? Yes. Well, the no, not for criminal and civil. Human rights violation is not necessarily, essentially, is it essentially a civil? Uh, it's civil. Yeah, yeah. It's civil. Well, it could, I mean, if it, if it falls under the penal code, then it can be treated as a criminal right. offense too, right? right? So it depends what. So human uh, torture, for example. Investing or investing or human rights violation are not a civil offense. Sorry. Investing or we have notified that district judges as civil uh, human rights courts. So there it is not a civil offense. I mean, it's not a civil uh, remedy. It's a criminal remedy. Very much a criminal. Uh, okay, remedy. in the United States, it's only civil. We don't have it as a criminal remedy. Right. So in in our situation. Yeah. Does it not mean that we are punishing the same person for the same offense twice? You're saying if you do criminal and civil? Yeah. No. Not uh, criminal and civil, again, Adam. Criminal and criminal. Because ah. in West Bengal, human rights courts are not uh, meeting out civil remedies. If it's based on the same set of facts and it's exactly the same, same incident, then yeah. I think you have an argument that it is double jeopardy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's criminal and criminal, then absolutely. Another thing is if it's criminal and civil, right? In that case, there are different burden. I mean, that, 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 it's, 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 it's different. Uh, but yeah, if it's, if it's criminal twice, then, then uh, I would think it is double jeopardy. I mean, I don't know enough about the, the, the court system and, and the issue, but it seems like it would be. Has no one challenged it? No, but we in West Bengal, there in heart, you know, all eight cases have been filed till now. Yeah. You know, so this thing uh, directly never came up because I'm not very sure about the factual aspect of the eight cases that have been filed in the school job. Yeah. So I'm not sure about whether it was all only some sentence was meted out or some only some compensation was given. I'm not sure because that changes the nature of the proceeding. You know. Uh, okay. If only a compensation is granted, it becomes quasi civil. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. We should continue talking about it, but yeah. I don't. Um, this is one aspect that you can think of. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Let, I wanted to switch back to issues of, um, of freedom of religion. And what about what, where we left off yesterday? This idea, in God we trust. Or, has anyone been to the United States before? No. What, in school? Do you, have you ever attended school? In, in, no. In high school, in middle school, in, in grade school? Anyone know what we do before, at the beginning of the day? Prayer. prayer. Not, not prayer. But we, that, that would be a problem. We pledge allegiance. Right? <coughs> we look at the American flag and we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, 
with, uh, with light, liberty and justice for all. So, the question then that comes up there is a question of one nation under God. Same as what's on my, my, my dollar bill. Um, how, how can we understand that, that idea of one nation under God? Uh, is that permissible, first of all, do people think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing that for, for many years in the U.S., so it is permissible. Um, but what makes it permissible? Because we are saying only God. We are not specifying God under any religion. Okay, but what if you said, okay, so what if you said, what if the teacher said, I want everyone right now to pray to God? What if the teacher said that? Before we start class, everyone put your head down, uh, or take a moment and speak with God. Would that be a problem? No. Uh, what if you don't believe in any God? Yeah, only for that case, this will be a problem. Okay. Only for that case, so this the... will be a problem. Sorry? Burdens are for the atheists. Okay, what about if, for example, they, right before graduation at a public school, they brought in a priest to give, uh, to start off with a prayer? Would that be a problem? Yes. That would be a problem. So, uh, individual prayer, problematic, because it is, again, it, it is pushing a religion, right? It is pushing a, a certain religious belief set, no? Um, but what about then this idea of one nation under God that we all say? People don't have to say it. If people want to, then they don't need to stay seated. But how does the court get away with this idea of one nation under God? Or how does the, the, the dollar bill? Anyone know? Anyone know when it was put on? I, I think it was in the 50s, somewhere around. <coughs> Anyone know why? Against communism, right. Against communism. It was put on against communism is the reason why. It was put on really to... Um, yeah, sort of atheist, right? Uh, sort of uh, totally secular society. So they put that uh, as a way of differentiating the United States from that. So the reason then, uh, in terms of why that was added, was precisely linked to historical reasons and not to religious reasons. At least that's the argument that the court has, has understood, and that's why they can get away with it. What about, for example, uh, let's say there's a town in Texas um, that historically uh, was founded based on um, biblical beliefs um, but by, a, by a religious group, and they decide in the center square to commemorate that founding. They put up a stone carving of a Bible. What about that? Is that okay? In Spain, would it be okay? Yeah. What about the United States? What what test do we have to apply in order to announce the Lemon test, yeah. And is there then too much entanglement? Now, it's a private organization putting it, but it's on public land, right? So the government has an obligation there. Um, could that be a problem? Yeah, you'd have to go into their intention. I mean, I remember one of the first questions that we asked, it doesn't, doesn't have a primarily secular effect, right? That would be sort of the focus of our analysis. And here, in a similar case, the answer was yes, because it... Um, Signified a particular religion. Uh, no, yeah, really, it more commemorated a history, okay. more than actually went to, to religious beliefs. Everyone understand that? There was another case in a courthouse uh, where the Chief Justice, uh, who's now running for Senate, actually, of, of the United States, um, he's retired and he's running for Senate, he put up the Ten Commandments. What about that? That they said no. That, that, that went too far. That it was clearly, I mean, as people walked in to the courthouse, there was a big religious, uh, it was the Ten Commandments, or whatever it was, the Ten Commandments, or maybe it was the New Testament. Um, and that, that, that the court said no. I mean, that, that goes too far. That the moment you walk into a, uh, and that it wasn't clear that he was doing that as a way of really you know, commemorating some sort of historical past, but he was doing it really to, um, he's an evangelical Christian, yeah? So again, you always have to really do that sort of second layer of analysis to see um, whether or not, uh, there. one more. What about, for example, uh, and I, I've seen this even here a little bit, uh, in the streets of in New York City, for example, we have a big Christmas tree or a nativity set. Everyone know a nativity set? A, baby, a little thing of baby Jesus, his parents, and so on. Um, that, that, when you go to the U.S., did you see it when you went to the U.S.? Were you there for Christmas? 
And do they have on public land Christmas trees? Yeah. How do they get away with that? Well, freedom of expression, but freedom of expression also can't cross over onto establishment. Right? So you're right about that. But it also can infringe on my st on the right of, uh, on the state establishment, right? See, in India, we celebrate Christmas more as a cultural thing, less as a religious thing. Yeah. Exactly. Like all exactly. of us, even Hindus are having Christmas trees at home. I noticed around here, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't mind it. We don't I think it's religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know that, yeah, when I was around here, I didn't know that Santa yeah. comes to Hindu, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, no, apparently so. It's so. more of a cultural thing. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. That's why. I think that's exactly it, exactly. You have to look at it to what it is. Now, what if there was a big, you know, the, they erected for Christmas a big cross with Jesus? Um, that would be a problem, that right? Would be more but Christmas trees, nativity sets, um, a big menorah for Hanukkah, for example. All of that, even though it does have some religious element to it, it also is very much interlinked with a holiday culture, right? Um, so I, I think that's it. A cross with Jesus hanging, probably a problem. A Christmas tree, a little nativity set, um, yeah, more or less a uh, menorah, uh, a Kwanzaa, um, I don't know what it's called. Um, you know, those things are okay. Yeah. I mean, they're linked to religion, yeah. But it, I think it is it's so widely accepted in, in, in society as being part of culture, the festival of lights, right? I mean, all that, that I think it, it is. So yeah, you have to make that. What about here, compared to, if we, if we, this question of establishment of religion, right? That's something that's quite unique to, uh, to the US, that it's right in our constitution. Um, here, is there anything? No, our constitution says that states shall not promote any religion. That is there. But, but we, does have, it? we have a very interesting uh, take on that. Our secularism means and implies, like you said yesterday, that in the USA you cannot, uh, like any religious establishment or religious books and the, the institutions promoting religious books and materials and literature, they cannot be uh, patronized by the state. But in India we have a negative take on that. Like there are, uh, liberties are granted to minorities, minorities means Christians and Muslims in India and other religions. They can have their own educational institutes and state subsidizes them actually. They have tax reductions, rebates and all that, so only to protect. So it's a secularism, but it's a proactive secularism. Ah, okay, okay. Yours is like a passive secularism. You don't promote any of them, full stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whosoever it is. For us, we promote the minorities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the religious institutes, okay? Mm -hmm. So there are schools uh, maintained by uh, Christian missionaries. There are schools maintained by madrasas, uh, the Muslim uh, religious uh, sects. And those are promoted and protected and given uh, doles by the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. So we have a like we are, we are a proactive secularism. We can yeah, 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 yeah. As against yours. Yeah, I mean that's something I think. You know, when we talked about freedom of expression before, we talked about these subtleties. Um, even though freedom of expression is, is protected in the U.S. more than in many places, nevertheless there are uh, the, the sort of other ways in which uh, li freedom of expression is. Is, is, is restricted, right? And I mentioned the university, and I think it's true that, you know, mentioning what, you know, talking about in relation to what you're saying, uh, you know, freedom of religion in the United States still, uh, there still is some level of, not establishment, but where I would argue that it goes too far. I mean, if we think about all the money in politics, for example, right? <coughs> I mean, the money in politics, uh, evangelical organizations, right, provide uh, lobby money to Congress, to the Republicans, right? So at the end of the day, even though technically in the legislation in the United States, we don't have a clear establishment, uh, or it can't, it can't favor religion, uh, or uh, promote religion, or inhibit, nevertheless, through back-channel ways, um, religion is, uh, plays a strong role in American uh, life, just as it does, in some ways more so, actually, than in, for instance, Spain and other Catholic countries. I mean, if we look at the discourse, if we compare the discourse of a politician in Spain to, or Spain, or Belgium, or France, or wherever, um, to the discourse of a uh, politician in the United States, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's so different. I mean, uh, think about Donald Trump now and all the campaigning that he's doing, uh, you know, for Ray Moore, I don't know if people have heard of him, he's a Senate candidate in Alabama. You know, uh, Donald Trump talking about, you know, he said on the campaign trend, this is what Donald Trump said, nobody knows the Bible better than Donald Trump. Um, that, that's what he said. That's what he said. Uh, nobody is a better Christian than Donald Trump. 
Um, he only speaks his mind. To be fair to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, most of the Americans think that way. They don't speak. Sure, sure, sure. But he says his mind. But, yeah. but, but, but he's not either of those. No, but, um, but, but he uses that to appeal, right? I mean, so, so there is a great interlinkage with religion and politics in the United States. Again, it can't be sponsored by by law itself. Um, but what is right in the right before inauguration? You know, we have this big inauguration ceremony every four years. Where does the president of the United States and his family go? Anyone know? And they film them doing it. Church. Church. <laughs> that is part of the routine. Right? He goes he goes to church with his family every morning. Donald Trump, George Bush, every day before the uh, inauguration. That's it. Um, what is, you know, the other day I was listening to the um, the campaign speech of uh, the campaign speech of Obama, trying to remember the good old days. And uh, uh, what does he say at the end of every speech? God bless America, right? Um, you know, so there is. I mean, uh, you know, there is that. Do they bring faith leaders to uh, to evangelical leaders to uh, the White House? Absolutely. So there is this sort of roundabout way in which religion plays an extremely strong role. I mean, keep in mind that somewhere around I don't know if it's fifty percent. I don't know what percentage, but what we call the Bible Belt of the United States. Have people heard of that? The Bible Belt is basically the South of the United States, where there's strong evangelical uh, Christians, right? Um, you know, and, and, and politics plays to that. Um, I, I don't think Donald Trump is a real, um, you know, devout man. Uh, maybe he is, um, but, uh, but but I, I tend not to think so. But nevertheless, um, you know, presidents and, and leaders, uh, senators, congressmen, congresswomen, I mean, they do have a certain obligation to infuse religion into their politics. Again, it can't come out so directly through legislation, but through these roundabout ways. Um, it, it, it does play a role. So I think that's something to keep in mind when we think about the implementation of these laws in the United States, that although on paper there is perhaps a greater neutrality, um, there is, I think, in many ways a greater influence, a more subtle influence, or not subtle, but that, that in which uh, religion uh, is infused or freedom of expression is restricted. What about from the general comments of the United Nations? Uh, do you think the United States is more or less in line with the general comments of the United Nations based on freedom of religion, both on establishment and free exercise. More in line uh, than I would say, for example, France or Belgium uh, or other countries that have taken certainly a more hard line stance towards. Um, to, one other thing, sorry. In Spain, for example, when we do our, our tax returns, do you do them at the end of every year? Do you have to do tax returns? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we, we can click off is do we want a percentage of our tax money to go to the Catholic Church? Now, that obviously in the United States um, <coughs> or go, would be impossible. No, I mean, that would without a doubt fail the lemon test. But in Spain, it is permissible that you can check do you want it to go to an NGO, uh, a secular NGO, or do you want it to go? To the Catholic uh, Archdiocese, and um, so, so again, um, there in, in many ways, when when there is religion in politics, or when there is religion within government, it perhaps is more direct. Uh, whereas in the United States, because we have these restrictions, it, it, it in part at least goes to a more roundabout way, and also because of the nature of society. Yeah. yeah. So we have a similar provision in India in taxation law, but that's not about any particular religion. There are institutes which are recognized well in, under the Income Tax Act. And if you donate to those institutes, there are religious institutes as well, there are NGOs as well. If you donate to them, the, that money is like considered to be tax-free to a certain limit. Oh, really? So that provision is also there, but it is secular. It's yeah. not unlike uh, huh. the one that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was only for Catholics. For us, it's like uh, it, it involves uh, institutes of every religion, yeah, yeah, as yeah. well as NGOs and secular bodies. Oh, interesting. Well, how, how do people view in the United States, from your point of view, this idea that a state has to remain Sort of neutral, secular. What do people think about that? Where in India? No, no, in, in, in the United, United States. States for example, what do people think? Uh, well, you have been successfully. Uh, you have or been in able India, or to. In India. You have been able to guard your uh, actual feelings. Uh -huh. uh, my very little experience and exposure to USA during my uh, <coughs> college there mm -hmm. was like they are very, very uh, fanatic. But they manage somehow yeah. to present to the world that they are better than the French people <laughs> or the Spaniards, I don't know. But uh, uh, basically, I heard people there are quite communal. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, don't mind me saying this. Wait, quite what? So, quite communal. I mean, quite communal. conscious of their religious uh, identities yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> scientists also. I mean, to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You yeah. want an honest opinion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's my impression. Okay, interesting. Well, no, 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 I think that's, that's a fair assessment. What, what do other people think? What do other people What do other people think? What about here? To what extent do you think here, based on what you understand about freedom of religion in relationship to either the United States, the United Nations, um, or Europe, what role should religion play uh, here? Should it be, uh, even though there is an obligation, you said, to, to stay neutral, should it play a bigger role? It already does? Politicians are using the religion thing as a more bank politics. Okay. In, in what way? Vote money. Forgetting the vote back. The vote back. Because, because some political parties uh, have this tendency that this particular sect of religion of people will vote for them because they are doing, they are promoting this. Yeah, in reality, it is minority. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Would people like to see that scaled back? Do, or do people think it is in a country that it's majority Hindu? No. Uh, After the division of India and Pakistan, so that are the uh, that is on the basis of religion only. Mm -hmm. So uh, the formation of the state and the name of the uh, name of India as considered as Hindustan, so it mm -hmm. is also somehow denoting uh, the uh, one religion. So that is why. In India, the religion is playing an important role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because but are there are there subtle pressures to practice religion? To uh, in your schools, for example, the schools do no, no, promote no, no. no. In public schools, there's no promotion of religion. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Minority institutions are only there, but there's no promotion of religion in uh, in a yeah, 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 yeah. schools. No promotion of religion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's then switch because just so that way we don't have. Come on, time. let's switch gears, um, and let's then talk about the question of gay and lesbian rights a little bit, yeah? Um, in the United States, uh, gay rights have advanced considerably uh, from the time of, have people heard of the Stonewall Riots? Uh, Stonewall Riots uh, were yesterday in the 60s in New York. Stonewall is a bar in, um, in, uh, in Manhattan, in the village. Have people heard of the village? Here in the southern Manhattan, uh, where police went in and they they they, they beat uh, the homosexuals. I mean, it was a really sort of the start of the gay rights movement in the United States, in New York, that spread to uh, to California um, and so on. But <coughs> nevertheless, up until fairly recently in the United States, many states in the union um, had anti-sodomy laws. Everyone know what I mean by that? Right? That punished. Um, male homosexual sex. So the question is, when you get a question on on, uh, well, on your exam, for example, or when we want to understand gay rights um, or, or any right that's not specifically enumerated in the Constitution, where do we look? Everyone follow that? Yeah. And under the 14th and the 5th Amendment, we have similar language, and it says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay? Nor deny anybody, anyone within its jurisdiction equal protection. So we have the state cannot deny anyone equal protection. The state cannot deny anyone life, liberty, or pro property without due process. Everyone understand that? Yeah. Now, in the Fifth Amendment, we have similar language, although it, it doesn't specifically say equal protection, but it's understood as being equal protection, which applies, this is between the state that you live in and, um, and the law. Everyone understand that? In the Fifth Amendment, it's about the federal government. Okay. See, so in this case, the state cannot deny you of life, liberty, or property. Under the Fifth Amendment, the government, the federal government, cannot deny you life, liberty, or property. And this law here, Article 14, um, has is uh, is really sort of the heart of many of our rights in the United States. Um, questions of health care, questions of education, questions of gay rights, of abortion, of marriage. Um, all of that falls really within these three words: life, liberty, or property. Right? 
and through the common law of the United States. Um, the, these two words have been interpreted, uh, for better or for worse, um, in, an a, in a search to answer questions uh, involving our rights. Everyone understand that? Everyone clear? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, from a UN perspective, what does the UN say about um, gay marriage? Does it, has it codified it as a right? No, it hasn't. It hasn't, precisely. It, it hasn't. Under the UN legislation, there isn't a right to gay marriage. We're moving in that direction, but um, the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, has come out in support of gay marriage. There's been a new push at the United Nations to recognize now, in terms of uh, spousal benefits, uh, same-sex couples, for example. So we're headed in that direction, I think. But I think because there is pushback uh, amongst Arab nations, uh, for example, the United States, well, maybe now more the United States, Latin American countries, for example, which are traditionally uh, quite Catholic, and many other countries, um, there has been a push against uh, the codification of uh, the right to marry extending to uh, gay and lesbian couples. But I think we are probably on that track. <coughs> Nevertheless, the United, the United Nations has placed a strong focus, uh, particularly in recent years, on equality and non-discrimination. Uh, and they have read the, the civil, and civil and political rights, social, economic, and cultural rights to extend to the rights of homosexuals. Right? Um, so, so, so there is support uh, as a collective in terms of ensuring equality, uh, equality of law. But nevertheless, it hasn't advanced, like in much of the world, um, to permitting uh, homosexual marriage or codifying it as a fundamental right. Um, so in the United States, um, now there's been an, an evolution in terms of, of, of uh, gay rights. If we look at the case uh, of Lawrence v. Texas, does anyone, anyone have a chance to see that piece? on page 456? <laughs> <coughs> so the question is, where does this is a case? Two police officers respond to a uh, a burglary. They enter into the wrong house and they find two men engaging, I guess they knock down the door, and they find two men uh, engaging in anal sex, right? Uh, immediately they're arrested under a, uh, a Texas statute. Sorry? Violation of Texas statute. Violation of Texas statute, exactly. Uh, that criminalizes this law. The, the, the law says um, any contact between any part of the genitals of one person and the mouth or anus of another person, or the penetration of the genitals or the anus of another person with, um, w with an object, right? So it, it, um, it, it criminalized that, although as we know it, it, it applied mainly um, sex between people uh, of the same sex. <coughs> um, it was described as deviant uh, sexual intercourse um, and, and so on and so on. Um, it actually, yeah, and it says, a person who commits an offense if he engages in deviant sexual intercourse with another individual of the same sex. And then it tells us uh, what it is, it's touching of the genitals and, and so on. So where, based here, um, where do we find, based on what you, you understand, what you've read, where, where do we find this question of uh, whether someone has a right to have um, gay sex? Where do we find it? It doesn't specifically say no state shall deprive any person of the right to have gay sex. I think the new clause that no one shall be deprived of the liberty of the due process. So which is it? Is it is it property, life, or liberty? No, life or liberty. 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 Exactly. It's exactly. It's a deprivation of a liberty, right? And what they say here in the first paragraph is liberty protects the person from unwarranted government intrusion into a dwelling or other private place. In our tradition, the state is not omnipresent in the house, and there are other spheres of our lives and existence outside the home where the state should not be a dominant present, namely our sex lives, right? Uh, freedom extends beyond spatial bounds. Liberty presumes an autonomy of self that includes freedom of thought, belief, expression, and certain intimate conduct. 
the, the interesting case involves liberty of the person, both in the spatial and the more transcendent dimension. So also take note here of the language. So this, although it's brought on a violation of Article 14, they do also acknowledge that there's a violation here of freedom of expression, right? Or they do at least allude to that. Now there is a, a you know that, that freedom of expression, again, is not only uh, expression in the sense of, of talking, um, but you know, if, for example, I kiss my wife on the metro, is that also expression? Yeah, it is. So there's a lot of intersection here, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier in the semester about human rights, of this interdependence, right? This interdependence of rights, that rights aren't just one or the other, but they intersect. There's a hand up. Four forty-three. <coughs> okay. So, um, previous to this case, uh, there had been another case called Bowers v. Hardwick. Had anyone heard of that case? Um, if you look at it on 445, um, the question here uh, was whether there was a fundamental right upon homosexuals to engage in sodomy, uh, in, in, in sodomy. Uh, and the court in that case answers, in, in, this, uh, in this case, in the negative, right? At that point, a case going be prior to Lawrence v. Texas, there's this other case called Bowers v. Hardwick, where a similar situation occurs, um, and the question uh, comes up is whether there is a fundamental right to engage in homosexual sex, right? So what they say here, um, if we um, let me just find the um, sorry, uh, let's see, um, sorry, okay. So what they say there in that case is that there is not a fundamental right. Yeah, in the case of Bowers v. Hardway. So when the court makes it, when we look at this, the question that we need to ask is, is what is being asked of, in this case, the right to engage in homosexual sex, is it a fundamental right? Everyone understand that? And if it is not a fundamental right under liberty, then the way that the court then analyzes it is under a level of intermediate scrutiny, right? Which makes it easier for the, what? For then the uh, government to be able to defend that it is. So they only have to defend, right, um, that there is an important government interest. Yeah, everyone understand that? And uh, you know, back, certainly going back into the 50s, 60s, um, you know, when, when homosexuality was uh, far more looked down upon than it is now, uh, the answer that, that uh, they were able to, the, the court was able to argue was, uh, no, 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 that, that it's not, fun, that it's, uh, that there is a government interest, right, an important government interest, protecting morality, health, and so on, right? Um, but in this case, they come back to this question. Is it a fundamental right? Um, and, and what do they say here? <coughs> what do they say here? Anyone? Sorry? 445. So tell, tell me, what, what are you referring to? The court began its entire discussion with Bowers as follows. The issue presented is whether the federal constitution confers a fundamental right upon homosexuals to engage. That was in Bowers. That was in Bowers. Bowers case, exactly. And, and they say no. And they say no. 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 That there wasn't one of them. But then this case comes up again. Uh, and the question then is is there a fundamental right now? Everyone follow that. So there wasn't now, there wasn't before, and now they're seeking to overturn the judgment of Bowers v. Hardwick, right? <coughs> Everyone follow that? So the court then needs to make um, make a determination. Um, uh, let me just hold on, let me just find. Hold on, there was just one thing that I wanted to find. Uh, Sorry, just give me one second. Hold on, just give me one second. Uh, thought I made a note. Okay, no, sorry, okay. Right, so essentially what, what they, they look for here is, is there a fundamental right, right? And how do they make that determination, whether there is a fundamental right? I mean, how, how, 
Now, how, how, what, what, what goes into that, in making that determination? What do people think? Well, there are you know, considerations range from history, tradition, and a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what makes something fundamental is, is, is history, yeah. um, the group that it's seeking to protect. And if we go back uh, to page, if we go to page 451, listen to what it tells us. It says, on the bottom, the present case does not involve minors. It does not involve persons who might be injured or coerced. It does not involve public conduct or prostitution. It does not involve whether the government must give formal recognition. The case does involve two adults who, with full and mutual consent from each other, engage in sexual practices common to homosexual lifestyle. The petitioners are entitled to respect for their private lives, right? So privacy, privacy. is the fundamental right here that the court is protecting, right? Um, the petitioners, uh, the state cannot demean their existence or control their destiny by making their private sexual conduct a crime. And if you read the case before that, they go into the stigma that, uh, the that sorry? The stigma is that uh, homosexual is uh, being homosexual actually is immoral. Exactly, exactly. That homosexuality has been around. Yeah, yeah, but what they say there is that homosexuality, that when it is criminalized, it becomes stigmatizing, right? And, and it has a real detrimental effect on them economically, socially, and so on. And they continue to say, their right to liberty under the due process clause gives them the full right to engage in their conduct without intervention by the state. It is a promise of the Constitution that there is a realm of personal liberty which the government may not enter. The Texas statute furthers no legitimate interest uh, which can justify its intrusion into the personal and private lives of the individual. Had those who drew and ratified the due process clause uh, of the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment known as liberty in its manifold possibilities, they might have been more specific. They did not presume to have interest. Actually, one thing that I want to bring up. It is, I forgot to mention this. So this case actually, it comes up with an interesting standard. It's neither really com uh, strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny. Actually, what, what, and if you read commentary on this, it's really somewhere more in the middle. And the government, nowhere do they say there's a fundamental right to homosexual uh, sex. They do say that there is a fundamental right to privacy, that it falls into that, but they leave open the door a little bit. Everyone understand that? So, and just because if you notice that what they talk there about there is, is there a, um, what's the term, they, a legitimate interest, right? An important government interest. So that, that kind of runs contrary to what they talked about before, which is this idea of it being fundamental, right? So the, the court here, I think, treads lightly. And I, it's something that I think, I mean, scholars still look at today, and, and there's not a clear definiteness to what it is. And I think because of the, the, the social questions surrounding uh, homosexuality, um, I think the court treads a little lightly. They don't go as far as to call it a uh, mm -hmm. fundamental right to engage in sex, um, but nevertheless, they don't uh, they don't call it a uh, non-right either. Yeah, of course, come on in. No, don't worry. Come on in. Um, so anyway, the point that we should take away from this class is that the question of um, how you doing? That's okay. Uh, the way that we understand gay rights in the United States is through this question of liberty. Okay, that, that's more than anything what you need to take away. The way that we understand it is through liberty and in relation, in the case of sexual activity, for example, the use of contraceptives. You, uh, yeah. Here, there's no prohibition against contraceptives. No? No. no. Um, the use of contraceptives, for example, all of that is done through uh, this analysis based on liberty. Everyone clear on that? Yeah. Okay. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, the next case that we have, which is a long case, and I, I don't want to go through in, in, in too much detail, but this is uh, the case that came out two years ago, uh, which legalized homosexual marriage in the United States. <coughs> this is a case called the Oberfeld case, um, which, uh, as I said, uh, So in this case here, um, it's an interesting case uh, because it deals with two constitutional questions here, is how they deal with 
the question of, is there a, a fundamental right, is there a human right to gay marriage? The case went to the Supreme Court after previous other attempts because the United States was split in terms of whether or not gay marriage was permissible, was legal, right? As I said, I think in the beginning months, in the beginning days of this class, <coughs> in certain states it was permissible. In New York, for example, California, I think Vermont, um, you know, much of the northeast of the United States, parts of the west, and then there was the middle, the south, where gay rights was not legal. What is the, the problem there, right? For many years, for about 15 years, the government allowed states to states to, to pick and choose, really, whether or not they wanted it, either through their court system or through their legislation. In some cases, there was civil unions and not marriage. In other states, there was marriage. But this, uh, this split allowing 50 different, or not 50 different, but two or three different possibilities um, had obviously significant implications uh, for the individuals who, who relied on uh, clarity, no, of the law. Uh, you marry in New York, you're a gay and lesbian, gay and lesbian couple, you take your car, you travel down to Oklahoma, you get into the state, and then by accident, you get into a bad car accident, your partner is in the hospital. Do you have rights to see that partner, your wife or your husband, in the state of Oklahoma, <coughs> under their law, prior to this case? Would you have had rights to do it? No. No. They would be considered as a spouse. Exactly, exactly. Right? So it caused all sorts of, of, uh, of serious legal issues, uh, moral and ethical issues, that someone whose partner is dying can't be uh, with that person, they can't give consent for that person. Uh, when there was a child involved, that also obviously complicated questions as well. So all of that um, eventually, over a period of about 15 or 20 years, about, 50, about 10, 10, 15 years, uh, eventually led to the Supreme Court after seeing that there was a growing consensus on the question of uh, gay rights, that in the United States there was a move towards allowing uh, gay marriage. Um, they eventually, uh, in 2015, took the Oberfeld case. Yeah, everyone, everyone follow? Yeah, yes? Yeah. Um, uh, and this case is analyzed under two parts of the Constitution, all over here. What, what, what parts do you think? Take a look. What are, do you think the two, the two claims that are made here? Equal protection and the... Yeah, exactly. Equal protection, uh, do we find that as a UN uh, human right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. Equal protection, equality, right? Uh, equality uh, before the laws, right? Um, all of that uh, there. And then uh, we have obviously also in the, um, uh, we have the question of liberty in, uh, UN, in UN uh, laws. Well. Um, so we get these two claims. So the first one is, is dealing with the question of marriage, right? That is, do homosexuals have a fundamental right to marry? How does the court rule here on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So how do they? But how do they? Take me through. How do they? How do they reason it? Idea? When you say equal protection, it's equally for them. If somebody is homosexual or heterosexual or whatever, they are entitled to equal protection of law. So the law treats them equally. Well, That's but not reason. necessarily. Before that, not in terms of marriage, right? That the law of marriage didn't apply equally. Okay. It applied to heterosexual couples, but not to homosexual couples. But in this case, I think. Uh, Court actually held that the states have to uh, actually give license to these marriages <coughs> people of the same sex. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this case reversed that. Yes. This case reversed. Sorry? Fourteenth Amendment. Fourteenth Amendment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I mean is, how do they, how do they arrive at that conclusion that that uh, there if should you be? Don't permit that. That is discriminatory, and that is also infringing the right of equality and liberty of expression. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to let me just find the the case. Um, let me just. So they. Let me just. Let me just, um, I just want to get to some language here. Yeah. Just one second. What did I do? Uh, 
So it says on page 474, under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, no state shall deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. Right? In addition, these liberties extend to certain personal choices. Yeah? So, what needs to be proven here is that the right to marry, yeah, the right to marry as a homosexual, um, that that is a fundamental right. Yeah? Everyone understand that? Right? They, the petitioners argue that it's a fundamental right. Why? Why, why would they argue that it's a fundamental right? Fundamental right because protection. Huh? Fundamental right stands protected. That's it, why. It gives them more protection, yeah. right? If it were non-fundamental, they could still argue it, it but it would, be, it would be easier for the government to overcome the level of scrutiny, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so they go through this, um, and they, they say, as this court held in Lawrence, which we just saw, same-sex couples have the same right as opposite to enjoy intimate association. Lawrence invalidated laws that made sex uh, intimacy a criminal act. Uh, all parties agree, many same-sex couples provide loving and nurturing homes to their children, whether children are presently being raised by such couples. Uh, most states have allowed gays and lesbians to adopt, either uh, as individuals or as same-sex couples. Fourth and finally, this court's cases and the nation's traditions make clear that marriage is the keystone of our natural order. Right, Alec, well, uh, um, 477. It says, for those reasons, just as a couple vows to support each other, so does society pledge to support that couple, offering symbolic recognition. There is no difference between same and opposite sex couples with, result, with, um, with respect to this principle. Yet by virtue of their exclusion, same sex couples are denied consolation of benefits. Everyone follow, everyone, yeah. So they begin to sort of take us through this question of why, why, why shouldn't it be a fundamental right to marry, right? Why shouldn't there, there be? Um, if we go to page 478, uh, the right of same-sex couples to marry uh, that is part of liberty promised by the Fourth Amendment is derived to from the guarantee of equal protection. Yeah? The due process clause and equal protection are connected in a profound way through the set forth uh, independent principles. Rights implicit in liberty and rights secured by equal protection may rest on different <coughs> precepts and are not always coextensive. Yet in some instances, each may be instructive as to the meaning. So what they talk about here is what we talked about again at the beginning of this, of this uh, course, this idea of interdependence, right? This idea of due process interconnected with ensuring uh, that everyone has equal protection, right? Interdepend interdependency of um, human rights. Um, now, if we go to the very last paragraph uh, on page 483, Listen to this last paragraph. It's a beautiful paragraph. They say, no union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in this case demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say that they disrespect the idea of marriage. <coughs> Their plea is that they do respect it. They respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants them that right. Yeah, it's a beautiful last paragraph, no? Um, and with that, um, we have gay marriage in the United States, yeah? Um, and, and so the question then is how do they come to that? And they come to it through, as I said, a two-pronged analysis. One is through the question of due process and liberty, right? That is that um, once they find that marriage, uh, which they had declared before, marriage is a fundamental right, their argument is that within that fundamental right, 
falls the right to gay marriage. Everyone understand that? So it's not, they're not saying here that gay marriage is a fundamental right, but they say marriage is a fundamental right, uh, and homosexuals have the right to participate in that marriage, right? That the reasons, any sort of compelling or important reason that the government may have to block it, that it's immoral, that it doesn't foster good families, they say it doesn't pass, pass the test of strict scrutiny. Everyone understand that? So that to morals are relative. That means they change over time. So, so morals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Morals change over time, and they say that. Uh, so again, it's not that there is a right to gay marriage, but there is a right to marriage, and homosexuals they find no compelling reason to exclude homosexuals from that liberty. Everyone understand that? The second part that they say is uh, the question of equal protection. Now, how do we deal with equal protection? Um, equal protection actually has an interesting analysis, yeah? In that it, it also, it's a two-part analysis. Um, there are certain groups that when we want to discriminate against them, there, there is automatically strict scrutiny involved, right? Everyone understand that. So, what does that mean? There are groups that the court has deemed to be historically marginalized, right? What groups might that be in the United States? So on race, if you're going to discriminate on the basis of race, not necessarily against uh, blacks, but if you're going to discriminate on the question of race, there has to be strict scrutiny. Okay? If there is, based on natural origin, yeah, that is where you're from, yeah, religious grounds, and then alienage. Those are the four grounds which are what are called suspect classes. People heard of that? So cool. Anyway, yeah, alienage, <coughs> race, religion, and nationality, right? And any time the government wants to um, apply a law unequally to a group, right, the government always has to meet the burden of strict scrutiny. Everyone understand that? But homosexuals don't fall within that group. So they're a non-suspect class. In which case, we're going to look at it through the lens of intermediate scrutiny. Everyone understand that? Yeah? Is that clear? So, whenever we're faced with an equal protection problem, the first question we want to ask is, is this group a suspect class or a non-suspect class? Once it's been ruled to be a non-suspect class, we, we use an intermediate level of scrutiny where the government just has to prove that there is an important government interest um, that is related to the means. Everyone understand that? <coughs> so here, they try to prove that um, homosexuals, that because they're going to apply the law to heterosexuals, marriage laws to heterosexuals and not to homosexuals, um, they basically argue that, look, there is an important uh, uh, cause, it's morality, so on and so on, but as you say, the court refutes that. and says, look, morality has changed, Questions of acceptability have changed. Um, this idea that uh, you know we need to protect families. The evidence doesn't support that uh, homosexuals raise uh, children any worse than, or maybe any better than um, heterosexual couples, for example. Right? Um, everyone follow that. So that's always our analysis. Now, if we had a law that specifically targeted based on race, that for example, we had a law uh, years ago, for example, that um, there was a famous case called Loving v. Virginia. I think is the case. Beautiful case, if anyone wants to read it. There's a movie, actually. It's a great movie. I saw it uh, on a plane once. Um, and uh, that was that in certain states in the South, there was a law against interracial marriage. Up until fairly, up until not too long ago. Yeah. So that was a, it was criminalized for a uh, a white person to marry a black person, and uh, precisely that's what happened in the case of Loving, uh, where they uh, they had to actually move to, they lived in Washington, D.C., uh, because uh, they were arrested for um, interracial marriage in, in there. Uh, and that law was invalidated um, through the question of equal protection, right? That there has to be some sort of compelling interest when we're talking about race, right? Because it's a suspect class, to not allow whites and blacks to marry. Um, now, 
What were the reasons that they gave? You could probably ima imagine that it was unnatural, uh, that it went against uh, you know, nature to have a black person and a white person. Yeah, in India, we use the term against the order of nature. Against the order of nature, exactly, exactly. And the court said that doesn't meet a compelling standard. Yeah. Okay. Everyone understand that? Yeah. So again, this is uh, thinking about this idea of equality of laws, uh, equality before laws, the question of um, liberty. What we can see here is that from the United Nations level, how it plays out on the state level, right? And the way that, it, that, that the United States implements the question of liberty, um, that they relate it to the question of privacy. Uh, liberty, the marriage falls within liberty. Everyone find that? Yeah. Because everyone, there is a law. Uh, in human rights, right, which is everyone has the right to marry. Yeah, but it specifically says male and female. Whereas here, we don't have an enumerated right to marry in the Constitution, but we find it within liberty. And, uh, in, 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 and the United States has interpreted that, I, unlike United Nations law, to apply to homosexuals. So in this way, I think the United States has taken a step forward, actually, uh, and, and has gone past what is its human rights obligation under international law. Everyone everyone follow that? Yeah. And then, similarly, uh, we also have, as I said, this question of equal protection, which we find under uh, almost every human rights convention uh, implemented one way or another. Every, everyone following? Yeah. So we have the law. We have UN law. Uh, even though I've said UN law came about after the Constitution, nevertheless we can look at what the United States does in relationship to its human rights obligations and we can see that in the case of gay marriage, um, it's, I think it, it, it's advanced more than, uh, than human rights in, um, uh, under the United Nations. Act. Okay, everyone, everyone good with that? Okay, then let's, uh, let, let's then take a look at the other case which is shock enough versus Austria. <coughs> when conven uh, under sorry the European Convention, um, we have a number of areas when we deal with questions of uh, gay rights, whether it has to do with with sodomy laws, whether it has to do with um, with marriage, uh, where it falls. First of all, we have under Article Twelve. Men and women of manageable age have the right to marry, right? So uh, it does give a specific right to marry, uh, although that has been interpreted as meaning, as applying, similar to the United Nations, to one man uh, with one woman. But more importantly, we have what we can think of as kind of like a catch-all clause, right? Which is Article 8, the right to respect for private and family life. Yeah? And that is that uh, we have two concepts here. One is family life, the other is private life. Uh, similar to this idea of life, liberty, and property, this gives us two, category, two categories where everything from the questions of marriage to adoption to the use of contraceptives, um, it, it kind of catches things that don't necessarily fall under, uh, or at least so clearly fall under, other conventions, right? And other um, <laughs> other uh, un other articles, yeah. So let's first talk about what is private life. When we talk about private, what exactly are we referring to there in private life? What types of things? What types of things might be we referring to? <coughs> so if I have a right to private life, what do I have a right to do? What if a police officer catches somebody masturbating? And under Polish law, it says nobody has the right to masturbate. Yeah? Could that fall under private life? Absolutely. Absolutely. That would fall under private life, yeah? Um, what else could fall under private life? So we know sexuality falls under private life. What else? Personal autonomy. Psycho uh, psychological well-being. Integrity, no unlawful surveillance falls under private life. Privacy, home, correspondence. Yeah. Just wanna 
read one thing down. <coughs> so it, one, what one of the court says in a separate case is it has to do with the inner circle in which we live our lives, right? What we do in our private lives, and essentially that sort of catch-all of private life. The right to establish relationships, birth control falls under private life, yeah. Here is birth control permitted? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. the state promotes that. Uh, state yeah, we have a population explosion. But not just contraceptives, but also, for example, the yeah, pill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oral okay. contraception, Pro and contraceptive. all yeah. forms of uh, birth okay. control measures. It promotes it over abstinence? Yes. Yeah. It promotes it over yeah. abstinence? Yes. What does yeah. it uh, See, abstinence is not something that the government deals with. Okay. The state doesn't promote or restrain abstinence. That's part of the religious uh, scriptures. Uh -huh. So that's uh, one line of uh, argument uh, forwarded by the religious people. But state doesn't promote that or state doesn't restrain that either. Okay, right. State promotes birth control measures. Okay, right. All the medical... Uh, Others. Okay. Right. So that is what... Since there's a huge population... In yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so we have this idea of private life under Article 8, and then it also gives us family life. What might fall under family life? Children. Sorry? Children. Could be, yeah, having children, for example, absolutely. What else? Huh? What else? Adoption, for example, could fall under family life. Maybe. Marriage, <laughs> marriage, sorry? Which? Maintenance. Maintenance, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that could fall under there. Custodial questions, for example, fall under family life. Um, what else? Uh, what else could fall under family life? Anything that deals with questions of family ties. Um, I mean, these are very broad categories, so there's not a set number, actually. One of the things that the court tells us <laughs> is that there's no exhaustive list of what is private and family life. But it is, uh, as, a, uh, as a judge in the U.S. defined obscenity as you know it when you see it, no? Um, and that, uh, in some ways, is how I would think about private and family life. You sort of know it when you see it. And it has to do with those sort of broad topics, family life dealing with family ties, family relationships, and so on, what goes on within uh, the unit of a family. And then private life has to do with our own personal lives. It has to do with our physical integrity, our psychological integrity, um, individual sexuality, for example. Oftentimes, things fall under both private and family life, right? This idea of, um, for instance, uh, you know, if I, uh, as, a, as, a man, as a homosexual, for example, um, you know, can I have sex with someone else? And then uh, that also has to do with family, if, for example, that person is my boyfriend, right? I mean, so there's, there oftentimes there's a lot of overlap between what is private and family life. But the important thing to know is that Article 8 sort of captures um, that area, right? It's sort of like a catch-all uh, thing. So, we get a case versus Austria, um, similar to, uh, to the case of um, Oberfeld, as to whether or not uh, there is a right to same-sex marriage. Yeah. Um, what is, so the court says, okay, that this is clearly an Article 8 question. Uh, it has to do with uh, the right to, um, to family life. Um, how does the court rule on it? So first of all, what does, what does under Article 8, what does the state have to prove, right, if they want to infringe? Again, has to be um, prescribed by law, in accordance with law, in a de in necessary in a democratic society, and then and in the interests of national security, public safety, economic well-being, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, or for the protection of rights of others, right? So very similar to what what, what we see in, um, in in the Oberfeld case. That an argument is based, obviously, on um, you know, Judeo-Christian Christian values, for example, that it may corrupt the society, immorality, and so on, uh, that it ruins the sanctity of marriage, right, which is the typical argument against uh, same-sex marriage. Um, and uh, anyway, so that, that's the argument, essentially, that Austria puts forward. In addition, they also put forward the fact that <coughs> these individuals have a right to a civil union. Everyone know what a civil union is? Yeah, right. Okay. So how does the court then analyze this case? They make their arguments in terms of why it's necessary in a democratic society, that it is prescribed by law, it's in accordance with law because the law defines marriage between a man and a woman. Um, how, does, how does the case deal with it? What do people, 
What do people, um, how do they deal with it? <laughs> Anyone know? Hmm? They focus heavily on the margin of appreciation, in this case, of, uh, of the state. And let me just read out what, um, what they say here, right? They say, um, actually, and one thing actually I didn't point out, but to take notice, one of the things that you oftentimes see when you look at uh, human rights jurisprudence in Europe, on the European court, is they make a clear interdependence of rights. Here, the, 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 it's a, the lawsuit is Article 14 in conjunction with Article 8. Article 14 here is prohibition of discrimination which is equality, right? Everyone, everyone, yeah, everyone knows that? So what they, the way that they argue this is it's discrimination in relationship to family and private life. Everyone follow that? Yeah. So they don't sue under two separate ones, but uh, under two separate ones, but they uh, enjoin the two and it's in conjunction with. We see that a lot, for example, in cases involving religious freedoms. It could be, um, Freedom of religion in conjunction with freedom of expression. Everyone say that? So it just, again, if you do go through European jurisprudence, it's something just to keep in mind that oftentimes uh, the way that we argue cases is through this idea of uh, enjoining or connecting um, to different rights. So what they say here is, first of all, they talk about this idea of discrimination. And they define it for us, right? They say, uh, in order for there to constitute a difference, uh, discrimination, there must be a difference in treatment of persons in, rel in, in relatively similar situations. That's the jurisprudence that they tell us on discrimination. So if we're arguing a case on discrimination, again, it has to be different treatment. Unlike the US, the way that this, this enforces questions of discri discrimination or equality before the law, it doesn't create separate categories, right? It doesn't allow uh, for this idea of suspect and non-suspect classes. It just has a sort of general framework to analyze discrimination, right? And that is whether or not two people of relatively similar situations are treated differently in relation to the law, okay? And then it says such a difference of treatment is discriminatory if it has no objective and reasonable justification, okay? In other words, if it does not pursue a legitimate aim or if there is not a reasonable relationship of proportionality between means employed and the aim sought. The contracting states, however, enjoy a margin of appreciation in assessing whether and to what extent differences are justified, right? So what they're saying is there is discrimination here. That is right. But merely by the fact that there is discrimination, that in itself doesn't lead to a violation. It has to be taken in conjunction with the margin of appreciation. Everyone follow that, right? So it, it's different than the US analysis. The US analysis says uh, again, it looks through strict scrutiny and you either meet it or you don't meet it, or intermediate scrutiny. Whereas here, there may be a violation, but it may also be justified, right? Everyone see that? Where I guess in the United States you could say the same, there may be a compelling reason uh, which would justify it. But again, here what they allow um, is a greater focus on um, culture and historical questions of that particular state. Everyone follow that? So, what they say here is that the scope of the margin of appreciation under paragraph 98 will vary according to the circumstances, the subject matter, and the background. Yeah. While the parties have not explicitly addressed the issue whether the applicants were in relatively similar situations, the court would start from the premise that same-sex couples are just as capable as different sex couples of entering into stable relationships. The, uh, the applicants argue they were discriminated against as same-sex couples. They go on to say, right, that <coughs> um, uh, that uh, where is it? Um, um, they say under paragraph 103. The court reiterates in this connection that in proceedings uh, originating in an individual application. It has to confine itself to examination of the case before it. Given that at the present it is open to applicants to enter into registered partnership, the court is not called upon to examine whether the lack of any legal means would constitute a violation. What remains to be examined is whether 
um, the respondent state should have, uh, should be able to do it. And what do they ultimately say here? What, what, what does, what do they ultimately decide here? Anyone know? What do they ultimately decide here? Is gay marriage, take a moment and look at it and see, do they ultimately decide in favor or against gay marriage? What they say is that this area, if you go to page, uh, um, if you go to paragraph 105, the area in question must therefore be regarded as one of evolving rights with no established consensus. The court cannot but note that there is an emerging European consensus towards legal recognition. Moreover, this tendency has developed rapidly. Nevertheless, uh, not yet a majority of states provide legal recognition, right? So they say, even though there is discrimination here, there, because there's no consensus, because <coughs> there's about a 60-40 a split uh, in the number of countries, or maybe more, 70-30, in the number of countries that allow same-sex marriage in Europe, because there's no clear consensus, the court says, we're going to permit <coughs> civil unions. Oh, well, we're, we're going to, and because civil unions are provided, that there's no need then to make this determination uh, whether something more is necessary. Does everyone understand that? So what they do here is they rely very heavily on margin of appreciation, really in a way to kind of escape the question. Saying, look, because there are states that support it, there are states that don't, there's no clear consensus here. Um, we're gonna, and because there is, there's a civil union here, which gives them some legal basis, they're not without any rights whatsoever, um, we're going to take a step back. So what this case tells us is that on social issues, in Europe, yeah. Questions of social, where there's not a clear consensus, the European court will give deference to the individual state to decide. On fundamental rights, it tends to create a much more narrow margin of appreciation. But on social rights, when there's no consensus, and even when there is, uh, it tends to provide much more breathing room for the state to make this justification. And the key there is, again, as I said, paragraph 105, um, where it says that although there is an emerging consensus, it, there still is not a consensus, right? Uh, there's not any clear clear rule within Europe, and therefore we're going to allow states to make their own decisions on this law. Everyone understand that? Good? Good? Yeah? Now, obviously, the question that, that, that may come up here is, well, then what the hell is the point of a European, oh, of a human rights court, right? And they're not going to, uh, you know, if they're going to allow states to do their own thing, well, then, then what's the point? Obviously, what the court tries to do, and this is something that I think many people are, are critical of, no, is um, taking into account the grand diversity of 47 states, again, with uh, some with very religious backgrounds, uh, with religious histories, taking into account this, uh, this diversity, uh, traditions and cultures uh, that vary from state to state, um, it, allows, it, it allows states on the question of gay marriage to make this determination on their own in accordance, uh, again, they always have to justify it, but in accordance with um, their country's own, own history. Now, we are moving in a direction where eventually uh, in Europe there will be a legal right to marry. Yeah, but uh, Europe, unlike the United States, does not have uh, a pronounced legal right to uh, gay marriage. Okay. The majority of states now, I think, all right, the majority, what are we, maybe about half, a little more perhaps actually, and it's, maybe it's not 70, but maybe it's about half or so, we, we can look at it exactly, um, have gay marriage. Spain, for example, has gay marriage. Some of the Nordic countries do. Um, Germany, no. Italy it doesn't have it. Uh, the UK does as of recent, though. I believe so. There are there is again there's a, there's a growing consensus, um, but it's still not there. And so in those cases, the way that the European Court treats this question is more in line with um, the jurisprudence and law of the United Nations. <coughs> okay. Any any questions on uh, on that? Oh. <coughs> we have a little time. Um, what about here in, in India? Is there a growing consensus towards gay marriage, towards gay rights? We are doing a flip-flop. 
A flu flu. Yeah, Could you do it by state here, similar no, to no, how? We have we have only one uh, one uh, constitution. So the Delhi High Court ruled that uh, 377, that is the the, the penal provision which criminalizes gay sex, same sex uh, union. So that was the Delhi High Court said it is uh, not uh, constitutional. It's against the ideals. So of if the one court rules, it applies to the whole. No, that that is for in con uh, connection with Supreme Court only. When Supreme Court rules, it applies to all the states. When the individual uh, High yeah. Court rules, that also uh, it acts not as a ratio, but it acts as a influence on us. Uh, not only, but like for a court, it is like a guideline. Yeah. We just cannot go against it until unless our own High Court has given something contrary or Supreme Court has given something contrary. What about, for, let's say, the High Court of Andhra Pradesh? No, uh, yeah, it, is bi it is binding except when there is a Supreme Court judgment contrary to it, uh, or there is a Calcutta High Court judgment contrary to it. Uh, okay. That so is how this precedent thing works. Calcutta? Yeah, it Calcutta is like, power. this is West Bengal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are in West Bengal, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So the Calcutta High Court is our parent. Ah, but uh, West Bengal. Right. But would it just apply to, what, so let's say for example, um, West Bengal High Court says that gay marriage is a constitutional right. Would that then apply to the whole country? No. 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 It, it will be binding or for, Cal uh, for yeah, West Bengal, but it, it, is, it, is, it may be referred to by the other states yeah. till the point it is not contradicted by Supreme Court or by that state's high court. So you could, you have a situation then more similar to the United States? No, in that individual state even though it's... No, but basically these, uh, these questions are always, I mean always, with maybe there are exceptions, I'm not sure. Always refer to the Supreme Court because it comes to the parents. The penal, uh, there's only one penal act, Indian Penal uh, Court, that applies to the whole of the country. Right. So if our High Court gives something against it, the law has to be changed by the Supreme Court only. Right. Uh -huh. The judgment law, it is basically. So would it be invalidated then, gay marriage, if the if the Court of Calcutta were to would it invalidate? Would 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 the fact that there is um, uh, criminal law? On the books, would that invalidate the gay, gay marriage? Uh, yeah, yeah. It would invalidate it. Yeah. The, the present position of law is it in, the effect is it invalidates. Uh, okay, okay. Because if a same sex uh, union is a, a criminal offense, right, so right. definitely the marriage is not valid. It so it would have to go to the, uh, the Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah, the, the, the Delhi High Court uh, ruled for, in favor of gay marriages. 377 was held to be unconstitutional. But when it went to Supreme Court, again, Supreme Court said no, we leave uh, it to the legislature. Uh, yeah. okay. So they, did, yeah. they actually did uh, what you said, uh, the court didn't say it's fundamental right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So and it's still pending. Is there, but that time Supreme Court had left it to the uh, legislature. Yeah. But still, it was like. But the Sahil Equality Commission Act that the Nalsa case, recognition of transgender. Yeah. But no, we are talking about the Supreme Court judgment back then. So what is the state? What is the? Yeah, yeah, it is subject. Yeah. But as of now, the criminalization stands. Yeah, yeah. So in that way, it's somewhat similar to to Europe also in that it leaves it to the legislature because that's essentially what they're saying here is yeah. we leave it to the state, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a little but different. But we do not declare but it, it unconstitutional. But the court kind of. We do not. Yeah, we do not declare it unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah. So it stands. In but a way, uh, by their passive uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, pronouncement, they have stood by right, the right. Uh, criminaliz yeah, yeah. criminalization. Is, is there a push though towards? Um, do you think in the next ten years will gay marriage be legal in, in India? There is a there is a, there is a strong movement going on, and uh, yeah, yeah, there's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that is sort of the winds that many countries yeah. are are moving towards, and as I said, that is I think in line with also the way the United Nations uh, is moving on the question of uh, gay rights. The United States surprisingly um, it wasn't an early country, uh, but but it was, um, you know, certainly uh, it was surprising. Well, Again, because there was such difference, I think there was a real realization. Also, keep in mind that it depends on the court, right? I mean, if you have a court that is more balanced, like uh, we've had in the United States, well, then you're li more likely to get opinions that are. If you were to present that same question now to the court of the Supreme Court, uh, where it, it, it leans more conservative, um, uh, more, well, it, it's still sort of split, but if one more person retires from the left, then it's we could have got it, like right? That. And that is exactly that is considerations come to exactly. So it it, it it depends a lot on obviously the ideology of um, the court. So anyway, but again, what you should take away from this discussion is a few things. That in the United States, the way that we uh, analyze these questions of, for instance, um, gay same-sex marriage, is through Article 14 of the Constitution uh, under <coughs> liberty, which uh, relates to the question of privacy in the case of, for instance, um, gay sex or uh, can also be the question of marriage. And although there's not a 
fundamental right to gay marriage, again, through a uh, analysis uh, based on there's intermediate scrutiny because they're not a suspect class, right? Um, the court finds that, well, in the case of, well, in the case of marriage, it's a, sorry, it's a, it, there's a compelling, so they have to meet the, the strict scrutiny standard, right? Then on the question of, uh, of, um, equa of, um, of uh, equality, um, again, in that case, because they're not a suspect class, it gets uh, under an intermediate scrutiny level. Everyone understand that? Yeah? yeah? Fine. In the case of Europe, the way that we analyze these questions is under a, uh, an Article 8. Uh, it could also be under Article 12 on marriage, uh, but in this case they chose to do it under Article 8 in conjunction with 14. That is, my right to form a family is being discriminated against. Yeah? And the way that we understand discrimination here is different in some ways from the way that we understand it in the U.S. Because in the U.S. we have a long history of discrimination against certain groups. For example, uh, in the early in the 8th, 20th century, the Chinese were heavily discriminated against in San Francisco or in many parts of the country, right? Um, historically in the United States, African Americans. So there is that special carve out for certain groups that have a historical level of discrimination, which lead us to, when we're gonna discriminate against them, to use a higher standard. Yeah, in all other cases, we're gonna use this question of intermediate. In the case of Europe, there is no differentiation. My time is up. <laughs> you take a 15 minutes break. No, just, I'll just finish this up. And then in the case of Europe, they don't create those subcategories of suspect class and non-suspect class. All classes that are being discriminated against, they apply um, paragraph 96 of the jurisprudence of 96, which is when there is a difference in treatment and uh, when uh, that treatment has no objective or reasonable justification. Everyone see that? Uh, page number 530, paragraph 96. Sorry? Paragraph 96. Okay? Everyone understand that? Yeah? Okay. All right, good. Um, we will then, uh, we'll, we'll reconvene in about 15, 20 minutes, yeah? Uh, when we come back, what we're going to look at is the question of um, women's rights and then cruel and unusual punishment. Okay? Okay, I'll see you next year. Good? Good, yeah? Okay. Any questions, yeah? Any questions? Everybody, again, follow. Again, this idea uh, of marriage, uh, which is a uh, which is a right, right, a civil and political right under uh, the UN Convention. What we looked at now is exactly how it extends uh, to the question of uh, homosexuality, not just actually marriage, but also uh, legal equality. Uh, how uh, it's been interpreted differently. Uh, in different jurisdictions, as we said in the United States, through the 14th Amendment, this idea of liberty uh, in relationship to marriage, and then this idea of equal protection. Uh, and in the case of Europe, once we look at the European Convention, we see it through Article 8, right to family and pri private and family life, and Article 14, uh, non-discrimination. Okay? So that's how we see it. It plays out. Um, okay. The next thing I want to look at then is the question of abortion. Yeah? Um, here in in uh, in India, how is abortion? Uh, we discussed that last. You know, we have a medical termination of. Oh, that's right, medical act, termination, right? Which protects the age and the uh, yeah, for which right. you can have it. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, under uh, under the UN, there's not a clear right to abortion. Uh, it's not written as a fundamental right, but it is uh, what the United Nations has said about it, is that um, states should legalize abortion, uh, and at the very least, they should uh, decriminalize it. And it should be made available in the case uh, that it could affect the life uh, or health of the mother. Okay? So there's not a clear-cut uh, recognition of its right, but the United Nations generally tends to lead towards less restrictive measures towards abortion, trying to, um, and making it essentially permissible. 
Um, around the world, what does abortion look like? What does abortion look like in most of the world? Most of the world, unless it's legalized, except that there are some uh, very, uh, Anyone know in, um, in the uh, American Convention on Human Rights, uh, under right to life, how does it, what does it say about abortion? Anyone know? Under the American Convention, life extends to the fetus. Right, Yeah, under, there's a specific recognition of it in the American Convention. Yeah, that's unlike, obviously, the Constitution, the United Nations legislation, or the European, or the African, okay? So under the, the, the American Convention is special in that way, in that it, per, it particularly uh, says that the right to life extends. Latin America is a relatively strongly Catholic region of the world, um, and as a result, uh, in, I think it's in both, most countries, uh, there is a prohibition or very limited uh, allowance of, um, of abortion, okay? Clear? Okay. So, what about in the United States? Um, in the United States, traditionally, uh, historically, abortion was not um, permitted. Uh, anyone know the name of the case? Roe versus Wade. Roe Wade. Wade. Exactly. Roe versus Wade is the case. Uh, did you know from this class, or you know it before? Not from this class. Okay. Uh, Roe versus Wade is the case uh, that legalized abortion in the U.S. What did Roe versus Wade say? Does anyone know? Well, first of all, where was, how was it analyzed, the question of abortion? Because it doesn't specifically say anything in the here, or in the European Convention, for that matter, on the question of abortion. <coughs> where do we find this question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, who said that? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right to privacy, precisely. Yeah, it's come, it comes in as a privacy act. And what, and what the court says here is matters involving the most intimate and personal choices, central to personal dignity, are protected. Right? Uh, on 582. Wade, um, there are three elements to abortion, right? Uh, there are three things that the court uh, says. One is that women have the right to choose without undue influence. Now, this is Roe versus Wade. Yeah. The second um, that um, uh, that, well, no, they acknowledge that the state has a uh, interest in protecting the fetus. I mean, they, they, they acknowledge it, right? Um, and that the state can restrict post viability, right? Once the child comes into the world, um, but the law must make an exception for when danger is posed to the woman. Okay. What they say is that it cannot be uh, before the first trimester, right? It says it cannot touch it. After that, the state can take into account these principles. Everyone understand that? So it, it, under Roe versus Wade, they don't say that the law does ha has no interest, right? They say that the law, or that the state does have an interest. They acknowledge that. But they say that that interest cannot come into play in making a decision on abortion prior to the end of the first uh, trimester. Right? Everyone understand that? How many trimesters in a pregnancy? Three. Okay, good. So it can be within the first, right? <clears throat> now, after some years later, uh, in 1991, we get the case of Planned Parenthood versus um, the governor, Casey, the governor of Pennsylvania. And this was an attempt 
um, to further restrict the rights of abortion. There are few issues in the United States that cause as much debate, uh, that fuel as much tension uh, as abortion, right? Because particularly for uh, people of faith, uh, life starts in many cases, not always, I mean, they believe oftentimes that life starts at the moment of conception. And this is a debate that will last for centuries, obviously, because no one will ever ascertain when does life really start, right? I mean, let's say, uh, it's, it's, it's a philosophical question more than it is a, um, uh, what would you call it, a biological question. Uh, no? Um, but clearly that debate is there. Uh, it, it's staunchly debated. It always forms an important part of U.S. presidential elections. Uh, you know, many people arguing that uh, Donald Trump is trying to replace the Supreme Court with the hope that um, they will overturn abortion rights in the United States would probably be a bit radical to do so, but nevertheless, um, we are seeing a bit of a shaving away uh, of abortion rights, and, and the Casey case clearly does that. Whereas uh, um, Roe versus Wade uh, legalized abortion because similar to the question of uh, gay rights, what was happening in the United States is that some states permitted abortion, other states didn't. So what happened to a woman from Texas who got an abortion in New York? And then when she went back to Texas, turns out what? When she goes to the doctor, the doctor notes that she had an abortion, calls the police, and that person can be arrested for violating the statute. Everyone understand? So it poses <coughs> when you have 50 states with 50 different uh, sets of, of, of laws, um, there is that potential for a conflict of laws. That's what happened in, the gay, in, in gay marriage cases, uh, and that's what happened again in the case of, of abortion. And that was what necessitated that um, this case go eventually to the Supreme Court after there was different states with different uh, laws and it was causing, obviously, conflict of laws. So we get the Planned Parenthood case. Um, how is it, is it analyzed? Does anyone recall? How do they deal with the question? What, what changes in this case? So it's, it's, it's a due process case, right? It falls under the 14th Amendment under due process. Um, but what, 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 where under the 14th Amendment does it fall? Liberty. Sorry? Liberty. Liberty. Liberty, precisely, under the question of liberty. Is abortion uh, considered a fundamental right under Roe versus Wade? No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fundamental right. Yeah, abortion under Roe versus Wade was declared a fundamental right. So overturning it would require what level of scrutiny? Actually, in Roe versus Wade, I have a doubt. Sorry? In Roe versus Wade, I have a doubt. As a matter of right, she claimed fundamental rights. Yeah. 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 Y
That is that abortion is still allowed. But with this standard, <coughs> um, prior, they cannot place an undue burden on the mother in terms of having an abortion. <coughs> Does that make clear? So, what does that tell us exactly? What does that? What, what are they telling us there? What, what are they telling us here? So, how has this changed? So, before we had the standard that they couldn't touch within the first trimester. They couldn't do anything in the first trimester, right? Um, th there couldn't be any sort of undue influence. Um, that women have a right to choose. Now they're saying women have a right to choose, um, but that some burden can be placed on the mother. Everyone understand that? What it can't be is an undue burden, an unnecessary burden, right? <coughs> so what does that mean from the point of view of the state in terms of what is permitted and what isn't permitted now? There's strict scrutiny. Well, there is strict scrutiny, right? But you know, they create this new standard, which is an undue burden standard. Okay, so that's what you missed, yeah. So they go from this idea, they say it's a fundamental right, right? Abortion is a fundamental right. But what they do is they say, okay, uh, nevertheless, uh, based on societal changes, new information, <laughs> partly because there is obviously a, there was a more conservative court at the time uh, that Casey was decided, they say, um, we're going to alter the standard. We're not going to do away with the right to abortion, yeah? But we're going to create undue burden. Now, this undue burden standard. Now, from the point of view, if we think about it in the context of the European state, right, where there is a margin of appreciation, does the undue burden standard ultimately allow for some margin of appreciation when states actually have to apply it? Yeah. 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 So that's what this does, is it, is it kind of shifts it from this clear, there cannot be any undue influence, at least in the first, there are, within the first trimester. You cannot touch, you cannot prevent the mother, right? Now what they say is, you know, look, there are states, uh, evangelical states, which there were before, but these evangelical states, strongly Christian states, there is a real split in the country, so we're going to create this standard of undue burden that allows for greater state interpretation. Everyone follow that? So in the case, for example, of New Mexico and Colorado, um, the right to abort extends up to what's called late-term abortions, up to almost the, the third trimester. Yeah, it extends to that. Uh, in most, uh, I don't think in any other state it does. In New York State, under in the first trimester, you can get an abortion without any questions asked. I think even maybe perhaps for part of the second semester, second semester, no, too much in the university world, um, uh, second trimester. I'm not sure up to what part. Um, but in other states, for example, parental consent is required. A girl can get an abortion in, uh, in New York, I believe, uh, without any questions asked, without parents needing to know. In other states, they've said it is within the concept of undue burden, and we're not unduly burdening this woman or this girl by requiring parents. Everyone understand that? In other states, they've now created um, a fetal monitor, where, or they've created um, a requirement that uh, before you get an abortion, and I don't know whether they ruled it against it, I'm not sure, um, they have to actually see the image of the child. Yeah. In other states, one of the ways that they've been attacking abortion has been through uh, requiring that abortion clinics be accredited by hospitals. Everyone understand that? So there have been different ways and different interpretations. If you go to New England and in the northeast of the United States, which tends to be more liberal, well, um, you find uh, far less restrictive means. Uh, in the south, which tends to be more evangelical, no, uh, more conservative, well, uh, again, they can't outlaw abortion. Um, but there are places now that, uh, where they say there hasn't been an undue burden, uh, where there's one abortion clinic left in the entire state um, because uh, they haven't been able to get accredited or for various reasons. So what this undue burden test does is it allows a certain margin of appreciation, right? And it allows the states themselves to make that determination. Now, if something really goes against it, it could eventually, it could be taken to the Supreme Court, right? But <coughs> what it allows is for the individual states to interpret what exactly undue burden means. And some states, based 
on culture, on politics and ideology. Well, have allowed abortion, obviously, in much more sort of liberal terms. And then others uh, have taken a more sort of conservative uh, or restrictive approach towards abortion, all based on this um, kind of ambiguous term of what is undue influence. Okay? Is that, is that clear? So again, we went from a less, re a more rest a less restrictive form of abortion to, uh, through this Casey judgment, uh, a more restrictive form. So we've actually had sort of an opposite evolution to uh, what we saw as gay rights uh, in the United States. Yes. Precisely. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about in Europe? Yeah. Anyone have a chance to read ABC? Versus Ireland. Catholic states won't permit abortion. That Catholics. Catholics. Yes. But don't spoil the story for us. Uh, but yes, that is the case. Okay, so ABC. Why is it called ABC, first of all? Sometimes you see cases that are ABC instead of, you know, Dubin versus Spain. Why is it ABC? Yeah, exactly. And, and in certain circumstances, obviously, uh, it's, there's a justification for putting it. Okay, good. Um, so we have three people that want to seek abortion, or that have sought abortions uh, in Ireland, uh, outside of Ireland, but then have been um, penalized through uh, the criminal code in Ireland. Yeah. One is A, who is a poor uh, woman. Uh, 537. The second one, B, uh, says she took the morning after pill. You know what the morning after, have you heard of the morning after pill? Yeah. Did you have that here as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, the morning after pill. Yeah. And then C, is it readily available though, the morning after? Is it, it's not taboo or, can you go to any pharmacy and get it? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. But here, for, I just had a curiosity. The question of sex here, my understanding here is that it, there's still sort of a, a traditional you know that sex out of marriage, it's not as common? It happens. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. Like everywhere. But it, it, it perhaps so, is it still sort of looked down upon in yes. traditional yes. Indian yeah. society? Yeah. But are young people do engage in uh, out of marriage. Yeah. Uh, like our parents would say sex outside of marriage is a taboo, but you won't. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, never, but even though there is that generational divide, there's still uh, availability of the uh, the after morning pill and, and whatnot. Do you? Um, what about for a young child? Does she need to get consent from her parents? Uh, <coughs> well, no, no, that yeah, yeah, no. What I'm referring to is two 16-year-olds, for example, have sex. So if you're 16. What I'm saying is, imagine two 16 year olds, though. They can get it too. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, interesting. And is, that, is there the same availability throughout the entire country or in areas that are more conservative? Is it more, is it more difficult to get? Sorry? Sorry, sorry? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. You can get it but then the person who's going to be giving it to the pharmacist is going to be looking at you. Ah, okay, okay. But uh, depending on where you are, or? Anywhere. Oh, really? Anywhere. Even the auntie sending you a look. Even what? A look. A look. A look. Oh, really? Yeah. And what the pharmacist say, make a comment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah they need to comment, and that's actually the stigma. Like, you are yeah, exactly. You're not supposed, supposed to do huh. exactly. that. That yeah, yeah, yeah. goes excites or I should marriage. You know, they cannot take it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so in the case of Ireland, uh, abortion was, um, oh, so there, there are three people, right? One, poor, second, the morning after pill failed, and then C, um, she was on, uh, she got pregnant while she was uh, taking chemotherapy, yeah, for, for cancer, right? And uh, her concern was that that would uh, damage the um, health of the baby and, and uh, could potentially also place her life at risk. All three women uh, seek abortions in, uh, in England. Uh, and they get abortions, and when they go to the doctor, uh, they're found to be, the doctor reports them, and they're found to be criminally uh, liable for uh, violating the penal code of, uh, of Ireland. So the case goes to the, um, 
goes to the court uh, in uh, of Ireland of uh, the European Court after exhausting all of its uh, internal remedies. <coughs> How does the court rule in this case? How does the case? How does the court rule here? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone know? So, what does the court say about the two women? So that they divide up the judgments, right? I mean, they don't create one uniform rule. What do they say in the case of um, A and B, the two women who uh, who do it out of perhaps more, we could say, an elective approach, right? Uh, that do it uh, not because of, of health reasons, but do it because um, that they don't want to carry the child. What does the court say here? Go to page 569. Again, they, they appeal to um, the question of margin of appreciation. And if you look at paragraph 227, the court says, the court concludes that the impugned restriction therefore pursued the legitimate aim of protection of morals, of which the protection in Ireland of the, art of the right to life of the unborn was one aspect. So taking into account that Ireland is a Catholic country, yeah. it is a Catholic country, yes. um, yeah, 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 right. uh, the, the court says that the, there is a legitimate aim within the margin of appreciation, which is, uh, well, the legitimate aim being um, the uh, protection of morals, and then there's a democratic necessity based on the fact that Ireland is a Catholic country, okay? And that is, is what goes to the protection of morals. <coughs> Okay, of basic morality. So, so yeah. In in this case, yeah. Like, like that was on. That was not out of. Like she didn't want. That was out of her mistake. Like she, she took after morning after pill. Uh, well, she she had an she had an abortion in uh, in in England. I don't think this was the morning after pill. I think this was a an abortion. Does, does it say morning after pill? So her right no. so to abortion was upheld by court? Um, no, it wasn't upheld. Her right to abortion, uh, she, they said that she didn't have a right to abortion. She did not have it. She did not have a right to abortion. In A and B, one who was poor, the other one who um, had sex in the morning after pill didn't work, uh, they said that there was no right to abortion. Yeah. Okay. And the <coughs> one who got uh, pregnant because of the rape? No, there was no rape. Yeah. Was there a rape? <laughs> no, there was no rape. There was a chemotherapy. No, C had huh? yeah. she, one of them. She had underwent chemotherapy. Okay. One of them had. I don't think anyone was raped. Yeah, it's page five forty. Ah, five forty. Oh, was there a rape? There was a rape. Judgment of the Supreme Court in the X case. Oh, that is. I read it somewhere. Um, so 14 years of these hours and gone. Yeah. Oh, what? Yeah. Para 39. This is a page 34. Page 540. Page 540, para 39. Yes. Oh, that's another case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's another case actually. Sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Yeah, it was pregnant because of the day. It was the Tony Jarrett versus X and others. Yeah, yeah, that's different, yeah. What about the case of um, C? How does the court rule in terms of C? That it must be allowed. That it must be allowed. Um, why, why does it say that? What, what is the, how does it overcome? Yeah. Yeah, so what the, what the court says here is that under medical grounds, um, when there is a real risk to the mother or to the fetus, that that, uh, could, that, 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 that Ireland has to permit it in those instances. Yeah. Um, so what the court basically says here, again, it takes into account the margin of appreciation, and it says here that even though there is a, a general, because it, it does acknowledge that there is a general consensus in Europe 
um, recognizing the right to abortion, right? It, it, it says that. It says, we are going to permit a margin of appreciation here, even though there is a general consensus on this question, right? There are the only states that don't allow abortion are that and Poland, yeah? Uh, Portugal, a few years ago, uh, legalized it. So they say, yeah, there is a recognition, there's a right. When that tends to happen, when there is obviously more clarity on a human right question, the margin of appreciation narrows. However, they do say here that taking into account uh, the history of Ireland, the fact that it is a recognized Catholic country, it would be wrong of us to say uh, that just because everyone else is doing it, countries that aren't Catholic, uh, that Ireland should have to do it the same way. So they find what they think, I guess, is middle ground, saying, look, in cases of elective procedures, abortion is not permitted. In cases where there is a real risk to the mother or the fetus, in those cases, um, the state has to permit an abortion. Okay? Sir? Yes. In case of elective procedures, like that is in, uh, irrespective of which, whichever trimester it is, like uh, irrespective of whether it is first, second, or third trimester? I don't think they specify it here, but no, it would probably be within the first trimester, is what it, I think. I'd have to double check to see whether it's a good question, whether or not they. Um, mm, anyone pick up on it? I don't think they specify it, but no, they definitely wouldn't, I, I think. So abortion won't be permitted? Not in, in, in cases of... Sorry. Elective. No, in elective, no. But I mean, even second or third trimester, I, I don't think would be allowed. Okay, we'll be up to the first... Uh, I, I believe so. I'd have to double check. It's a good question, and I'm not totally sure. Recently in India, I'd just like to share, because I found recently in India, it was two months back, there was this rape victim. She was a minor, mm -hmm. and during the second semester, uh, second trimester, sorry, uh, she moved uh, court uh, claiming because that was not permitted under this uh, Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act. So she moved and ultimately Supreme Court permitted because they set up a medical panel which uh, to seek advice as to whether it will be safe for the girl to undergo abortion or whether it will cause a threat to her life also. And the medical uh, board said no, it, it, it can be uh, safe for the girl. So thereafter Supreme Court permitted her to abort. Oh, really? She was a minor victim of rape. She didn't want to carry the baby. Huh. So okay. there was no medical risk. Uh, rather, there was a medical risk on the life of the mother because it was uh, she was already into the second trimester. But the Supreme Court made an exception and allowed that. Okay, okay, okay. It happened. I understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, in the U.S. it would also be. And, and, um, and here, in the case of Ireland, I think it would also be. And you got it. And you got it. You got it. And you got it. Stand up. It's unnecessary for it's for it's rape. It's yeah. It's unnecessary for carrying the child. This is all medical procedures. Also, this is a very safe system. It's allowed. Everybody cannot like almost all. But not Ireland. Except for Ireland. Ireland is all this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> but again, yeah, it, it takes. It allows. It's a state by state question, right? So it allows. So if suddenly um, Spain decides to uh, prohibit abortions, well, then you know they would have to be able to justify what that reason would be. And perhaps in Spain it would be harder, uh, particularly because they've already had abortion uh, legal for, for quite some time. And second of all, it's not a Catholic country, right? I mean, it has a history of Catholicism, but it's not per se a Catholic country. So the justification there, uh, again, uh, on, on moral grounds, would be more difficult. OK? Question? Question? I think Ireland brought a legislation with regard to abortion in 2015. Where? In Ireland. In yes. Ireland? Yes. And that is similar to the same laws which was the. Yeah, I mean, basically, they, they've just sort of codified. Because um, the amnesty for pressure no, that we need the abortion law. Right? Yeah, I mean, basically, they, 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 there was, if I'm not mistaken, a reform. Uh, and basically, on, under medical conditions, they can yeah. get it. But under all other uh, non-elective uh, uh, elective uh, conditions, they can't. So yeah, it, exactly. It just sort of standardized, uh, which is what they had to do with this judgment, right? I mean, uh, part of this is the so idea that there has to be. So they will force even a rape victim to carry. No, I, rape would, I think is the other exception. <coughs> okay. I think rape. It doesn't say it in here, but I think under the reform, it allows for rape as well. I'm, I'm quite. I'm not 100 percent, but I'm pretty sure. Okay. So rape or. Uh, okay. okay. All right. I know we went through it a little quick and it was sort of a general, but everyone follow along. Again, so two different approaches when we deal with abortion under um, 
the European Convention. We go to Article uh, 8, uh, which is right to family and private life. Yeah, here it falls under private life, has to do with physical autonomy. Um, uh, and uh, again, under European law, uh, it's not a fundamental, it's not a right, as we can see. It is a right in, in limited cases, in the case of health, um, but it's not a, a right per se. It hasn't been declared a right by the um, by the courts, yeah. Uh, in the case of the United States, uh, in some ways, some would argue that we've gone backwards on abortion, uh, whereas abortion is a fundamental right. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we had Roe versus Wade, uh, which liberalized it, and then we had Casey, uh, which sought to uh, sort of impose, in a way, a, a sort of margin of appreciation, uh, which took it back, makes it easier for states to restrict. They can't restrict it outright, but they can do things to create more obstacles, even within the first trimester, um, to limit abortion rights. Yeah? Okay? Good? Okay. Uh, and then the last question that we're going to deal with today, uh, or this class, is a question of torture uh, and uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah? <coughs> Just very quickly, um, under Article 3, if you notice on the European Convention, uh, in response, I was all reflecting uh, international norms on, um, on torture. No one shall be subject to torture or to inhumane or degrading treatment. Right? Notice um, that it doesn't offer anything else. Right? It's absolute. Unlike the other rights that we've seen in this class, expression, religion, uh, um, private and, and family life, uh, under uh, Article 3, uh, there is no exception to torture. Yeah, everyone? Everyone clear? Yeah? Okay. Um, <coughs> now, uh, how, how has Europe dealt with the question of torture uh, or cruel and unusual punishment? We have two interesting cases here. One, and I'll just sort of summarize, but one is the Soren case. Soren versus the United Kingdom, uh, a case that I, I, quite, uh, I, I quite like. Um, well, it's quite interesting. And this was a, I think I mentioned at the very beginning of this course, there was a uh, man who killed his in-laws in Virginia. He was uh, dating a uh, woman from Virginia. He killed them. He was German. Uh, and he fled to, um, the page is? 741. 741. <laughs> uh, and it, it, um, what they say here is that, uh, anyway, so he, he, the state of Virginia is seeking his extradition for the murders, uh, and he opposes it uh, in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom uh, supports his extradition uh, based on a, a treaty between the United States and the United Kingdom. The case eventually goes to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, let me ask you this. Does the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the European Convention, specifically outlaw the death penalty? No, it doesn't. The Council of Europe, to be part of the Council of Europe, you technically cannot have the death penalty. And the Council of Europe is part is, is where we find the European uh, Court of Human Rights. But the European Court of Human Rights has never in its legislation outlawed the death penalty. Okay? What's interesting about this case is that they, uh, they, they, they rule for the petitioner. Yeah. And what they say here, and this is where we get a difference with the United States, is that they say it's not the death penalty which is cruel. They don't deal with the question of whether that is cruel and unusual punishment or whether it is sort of torture or inhumane and degrading treatment. But they say what is uh, torturous or inhumane and degrading is death row. Everyone know what death row is? That is that period when you're waiting. They say, the solitary confinement, the, the psychological torture of not knowing when will I die, when, will it be tomorrow, will they grant my appeal. They say uh, also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they also cite uh, sexual violence oftentimes. 23 and a half hours a day in your cell. Um, they say that that in itself is enough uh, to find that there's been a violation of Article 3 under the Convention. Everyone get so that? Assuming that they allow, uh, they deny extradition. Assuming that they allow it, right? So it's like so hypothetical. Uh, but when there's a real risk, then that is, then, then the court can rule to stop it, because once they hand them over. Never, never coming to India. Okay. What? We are actually awaiting one extradition of one of the. Yeah, yeah. Under the European Convention, and I imagine it's the same in India, but because once once you hand the person over, 
then they can't do anything. So if there's a real risk, then it's the same thing, for example, there was a case, uh, there's been cases, for example, on, um, on deporting migrants, right? Um, again, the question is, if they're going to face a real risk in their home countries of persecution, of death, or whatever, uh, even though it's still hypothetical, uh, the European court won't permit their deportation, right? Because it's not only that a, that a, uh, a torture or inhumane degrading treatment has occurred, but that it, there's an imminency to it occurring. Everyone, everyone see that? Is it not the same in, in, in India? Identical. Oh, okay. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because otherwise, what would be the point then? If they know, you know what I mean? Uh, there's that penalty, there's <coughs> that rule, they're yeah. waiting for that period. No, no, but I'm talking about and the potential threat. The court there won't. No, uh, see, we uh, we are on the reverse side actually. We are facing this. This this argument is being made by one person named Vijay Malia. Uh -huh. He owns some airlines and all. He's a obscenely rich man who uh -huh. has cheated Indian courts of thousands of crores of whatever. Uh -huh. So he there's an extradition prayer by the government of India pending before the British courts. And the plea taken by Mr. Malia is that only that if I am uh, if I am sent back to India, uh, I'll be facing tortures in the ah, okay. protection homes. So that where, is where, where is he now? He's in Britain only, London only. In where? London. He's in London. Ah, uh, London. Ah, okay. So, we're many rich Indians. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we were. I was just asking. Said on this application, if we deny extradition, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, so he's going to stay yeah, there yeah. only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's it. It's the same thing. The court will, will consider it the same. But actually, what they say here is that there has to be uh, that it could happen or there is a real risk. Right? There's a real risk that it could happen, is what the court says here, right? It can't be some sort of theoretical or hypothetical risk, but the, the, the petitioner has to demonstrate in these cases that there is a real risk. The same thing, for example, we can apply this to questions of, um, let's say, water rights, right? Uh, this idea that uh, if they build a dam here or if, if we allow oil, uh, exploration here, this will uh, lead to contamination of our water. The right? risk related to that. Right. In other words, is there a real risk? If it's just sort of a hypothetical, sort of tenuous risk, then the court won't do it. But if you can demonstrate that there's a real risk, that if we begin to dig here, our water will be contaminated, then that would fall there. How does the court differentiate between, yeah? There was another case in international law. One person from India was sent back to Portugal. He was uh, in Portugal. He committed some crime uh, related to India. That time, uh, the same thing. What what with with Vijay Malia had happened. Okay. But that uh, person was uh, the Portuguese uh, gave that person to India, and after that, he was convicted and was hanged. Something like he, he was okay. convicted, and then uh, it was declared that he'll be hanged. Mm -hmm. So at that time, there was no death penalty in Portugal. So Portuguese now want huh. him. And yeah. said that this is a human rights violation. Oh, so can, can they do that? Or even if they are asking for in, like Indian courts and all that, they don't give him back. Because it's their contention that we don't give death penalties. Yeah. For this crime, you are not supposed to do that. Okay? Yeah. Because he was there. So you're saying, could they, if they don't give the death penalty, could they. If they, if they, they, they will give him lifetime imprisonment. Yeah. That is what. That is what the treaty was with India. Yeah. I just forgot the case name, but I read that in uh, international law. But at that time, India said yes, and then uh, uh, he got, uh, like they got that person, and they uh, sentenced him to death. They said what? Sentenced him to death. Yeah. But so they, they who, who extradited him though? Portugal, 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 Portugal is asking him back because this is the yeah. main thing. Putting a person yeah. Back. Yeah, once you've handed someone over, it's pretty difficult that you get them now, back. Even mm -hmm. now, that person is uh, that is pending, and Portuguese have started their own um, to to get this person back. Yeah. People, they have started their own court. And where they're doing it at the international court? Is that? International. Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, um, you know, does I don't know. I mean, does uh, does Portugal have a right to uh, you know, reclaim? someone who's not a Portuguese. If, if the, the citizen is Portuguese, that would be... But once they handed him over, uh, I, I don't see any grounds that they could then ask for him to be sent back. You know, I mean, he has no... I mean, if he has, any, if he has no connection to Portugal, I mean, other than the fact that he went through their judicial system, and I don't see it. If he were Portuguese... Okay. If he were Portuguese, if he had some sort of you know, Portuguese, some link to Portugal, um, that, that wasn't tenuous, but if he just went there to escape the judgment, 
Um, I, I don't think then they could reclaim them. <coughs> to me, it sounds more like a mistake on the part of Portugal in that they didn't do their due diligence in ascertaining whether or not there was a um, uh, there was a real risk to that person, right? Uh, because even I mean, life sentence uh, in, in Europe, the life sentence uh, really doesn't go beyond about 30 to 35 years. You know? So, so while dealing with this question, do we simply overlook the part, the jurisdiction part? Um, in you which? Know, I, I mean, human rights, all right, but do we just simply overlook the jurisdiction part? You mean the country where the country where it was committed, the country yeah. which has right to try that offence? You know, well, we so do you simply say because human rights say, uh, or maybe Portugal or some other country, yeah. they say that, or like you said in Virginia, the United Kingdom, they said there are tortures there. But then that is their domestic law. The crime was committed there. So they have the jurisdiction to try it and yes, I mean, but, sentence but, them as for their law, yes, but, which is valid. But then the state that hands them over is in violation of international It's like policing the rights. police. I mean, it's I mean, like governing the government. It's but like, but yeah. that's the whole point of human rights norms, right? This idea that a state can't put another person in a... Um, he is not putting another person. Well, he is. State is putting the person who has committed the offense there, in that state. So they have in their every right, they well, have the right Well, to they have a right, they have an obligation to hand them over, yes. But the problem is, if they hand them over, and the conditions they are violate, they're either torturous or they are inhumane and degrading, then the state that hands them over has not protected that individual, right? I mean, that's the problem there. When we go back to these three principles of respect, protect, fulfill, the government... So all the theories of the, you know, justice to the victim and all, how, 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 I mean, what happens to those theories? Well, what this person could be tried... The for the victim. Could be tried in the country, potentially, where that person is. For, you know what I mean? So that person uh, can I mean, be... I'm, I'm, I'm living in India. Someone murders me. So I have a right to be treated under the Indian law as a victim. <coughs> you see, so when you protect somebody's well, human rights, you are. Been but but you, but you human rights. Has not been restricted, but the certain thing that you have signed a certain treaty with the, uh, like UDHR, you have signed, and that is prohibiting uh, the certain. You cannot even uh, not give a death penalty to that person. That uh, uh, you cannot give a death penalty to the accused. The trial has not been restricted. And the they can trial the, the matter. The if, if they are getting back that person, they can. If they, they are getting back that uh, person, they cannot give a death penalty yeah, to that I'm, person. I'm well, but human rights treaty. goes both ways it's too. I mean, human rights. case, I'm not talking of the treaty. But there's no treaty involved there. But, but the, the person, question. the person who committed the crime, also has human rights, and they have a right uh, not to uh, to be free of torture and inhumane and degrading treatment. I mean that's. And that's the thing. You have a right. I was a victim, obviously, to to justice and so yeah. forth. But uh, that person who's also on trial, uh, that defendant has rights. I mean, just, just, just you are a person. I mean, uh, but but you can't. It, so but you can't. But I think we can't confuse what is emotion and anger <coughs> with what is no no uh, a legal victims framework. Are not, don't demean victims' rights by calling it emotions and anger. No no only. no no. There there is a right, no. but there's also emotion no. that comes in there. And no. as much as we will say, you know, this person no, did this, no. we want them. No, 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 there no. are laws. No no no. no. <laughs> You are, you are mistaken here. No, I'm sorry no. I disagree. But I definitely disagree. Victims' rights are not mere emotions. Don't you mean? Not mere emotions. No, that's the delivery but system is based on that. We initiated but the whole codification and, I mean, you know, the laws are put in place first of all but, for but that. But think about it. Think about it. How that many times optimum. does a bad crime happen and what people call for, this person needs to get no, killed, this person about, needs no, to get beaten. No, no, it's not about revenge. It's not about vengeance. Well, okay. But, it's not about vengeance. But if there are it's human about rights. justice only. Okay, okay. But, but, eye for an eye and kill him or mask yeah, yeah. No, but what I'm saying is that if that person would come back here and face degrading and inhumane treatment, then it violates that person's human rights and it almost doesn't, it amounts so to revenge in that case. If suppose the whole of the country's judicial system, any country for that matter, yeah. when you are treating, let's say Virginia, so the United Kingdom, uh, the, 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 the human rights code there, has the right to come to a conclusion that the whole of the Virginia judicial system is treating their uh, accused or convicts uh, inhumanly, well, and that is all right. I mean, think about it. Just think about I it. I mean, it's okay. I mean, yeah. I, I personally yeah, think I mean, it's, just think about it's okay. It. I, my, I personally think that um, death row. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, it's a different standard. Yeah. It's, a, it's a different standard yeah. than in um, than in, in, in the United States. And this is also a difference that we have to realize. But from a European perspective, or from the court, they have an obligation not to place people in conditions that violate the European understanding of. 
uh, cruel or unusual punishment. That no? can be treated. That can be dealt with. Well, they it can, can be. be conditions that you cannot or you have to improve on this and that. Well, but they cannot deny the state the right to try its accused. Well, what they said was, uh, if Virginia can give us a guarantee that this person won't get the death penalty, then we will. And that's what ended up happening. If Virginia gave a guarantee that, and that is, I or think, in my opinion, he will be kept in death row. He will be hanged right there, there on. I mean, no. he will not be kept in death row. They didn't have. No, no, but he, he was. He was in jail. jail. The, the Human Rights Court didn't have a problem with death penalty. They had a problem with keeping him in death row. Well, we don't know because death penalty hasn't uh, hasn't been dealt with. Um, yeah, here they, they say we don't even need to death death penalty because we're first dealing with death row. That that in itself, 23 and a half hours a day, the psychological trauma. I mean, and this is a big difference that we have to see with the United States. In the United States, we're moving away from it, but solitary confinement. Uh, is still widely used for years at a time. And there was just an article the other day in the New York Times written by the commissioner of uh, the prison system of Colorado who said one of the things he did was he abolished the use of long-term solitary confinement precisely because uh, th there's lots of evidence that it leads to schizophrenia, psychological, and, and that's not, uh, at least in my opinion, um, what a justice system is there for. A justice system is there to punish but not to create mental illness, not to create feeling. And the problem there is, if you put someone on death row, because it's not that that person is going to be on death row for two days. The average person in the U.S. stays on death row for something like 12 years because of backlogs, because of... So you know, what they're saying there is, as a court, as a European court, we have an obligation, and our understanding of what is cruel and unusual punishment may differ from the United States, but our, uh, our, our job here is to implement or to interpret the law according to European values. Um, and I think, uh, and actually the United Nations I think would agree, I think the United States is an outlier on what is cruel and unusual punishment. Um, the United Nations has advocated uh, for far less use of solitary confinement. The United Nations, uh, for example, on the death penalty, what it says under the uh, civil and political rights is that the death penalty may be used but only in the most extreme cases and it should be phased out, right? The United States is only is one of only a handful of countries that still uses the death penalty. So even the way we interpret uh, cruel and unusual punishment varies considerably. Um, but what you know, but from a European perspective, uh, yeah, I mean the, the United States approach to to punishment goes beyond what is permissible under uh, cruel and unusual punishment. No, so it's it, I think this is where we where we see a big difference in terms of interpretation and ap application. Uh, of of these concepts, the United States is much more focused on um, retribution, right? On on revenge, on severe punishment, two three years in solitary confinement, basically no light, no physical contact, uh, no no contact period, and the European <coughs> approach is uh, much more, and in terms of um, punishment, is much more is less concerned with this idea of. Um, revenge and retribution. That's more concerned with the idea of, of rehabilitation, no? And um, uh, so I think we, we see a big difference there in terms of how we understand punishment uh, and how in the United States we can justify uh, punishment with not quite being cruel and unusual or being torturous. Whereas in Europe, they set a much lower bar. They say that um, you know people can be held without liberty, obviously with due process, but. Um, you know, that's where it stops. Once we begin to place people in solitary confinement, um, you know, uh, put them in situations that can cause schizophrenia, that in Europe it's, it's, it's unacceptable. You know? um, anyway, so that, that's, um, that, that was this case. There's one other case very briefly that I want to mention, um, which is the case of um, uh, Boyid versus Belgium. Um, I'll just very briefly mention... Um, um, uh, thank you. And just I'll, I'll very briefly and simply summarize, but this is a case about a young girl uh, who is traveling um, to Toronto. She was there with some form of an uncle uh, and she had to transfer through Belgium. Uh, anyway, she didn't have the proper paperwork. She's put into a holding jail uh, at the uh, airport for uh, quite a few weeks until her case is sorted out. She's placed in an area with other adults. Um, for, for a time period, she was denied the right to make phone calls. Um, and what the court rules here is that even though it wasn't torture, right, because torture has an intentional aspect to it, um, it nevertheless, uh, it causes severe 
It's inhumane and degrading because it caused, again, taking into account her young age, the duration, the environment, um, that that in itself caused uh, mental and physical suffering. Um, you know, again, taking into account the, the overall situation. So it's not only this idea that it's placing someone on death row, but we also have this idea of, um, of inhumane and degrading treatment, and that is, it has a much less, it has a less, a lesser threshold than torture, right? Um, but it, um, you know, and, and torture is usually done purposely, right? Of, of extracting information, there's an intentional aspect to it. But even in cases where it's not intentional, again, taking into account the severe impact that it has on someone's psychological and, and physical uh, and physical well-being, that in itself, the court says, can amount to uh, inhumane and degrading treatment, and they find a violation uh, under Article 3 of the uh, of the convention, right? The fact that the girl, again, was deprived access to make calls, she was put in a, in a jail, she could have been put, for example, with a family instead. Um, there was nothing wrong with them keeping her while her case was pending, um, but, again, putting her in jail with other adults, <coughs> again, denying her um, basic forms of justice and so on, um, the court says that that goes um, too far. And we see quite a few cases in Europe that fall under inhumane and degrading treatment, particularly in relationship to jail conditions. Um, again, putting someone in a cell for uh, 23 hours a day, it may not necessarily be torture, although it could be, um, but it is certainly inhumane and degrading treatment um, based on the, uh, again, the level of severity the impact that it has on that um, person. Uh, also, the same thing, oftentimes in, in much of the world we see prisons where people sleep on the floor, it's dirty, there's not access to clean water, toilets and so on. Um, all of that uh, is inhumane and degrading uh, treatment under the uh, convention. So what we should just take away from this, uh, this question here is um, we do see a difference in application between torture, inhumane and degrading treatment between the US and Europe. Europe is much more in line with the UN standards. Um, the United States has taken a much sort of more expansive role, uh, or much more, much more liberty uh, in interpreting what is uh, inhumane and degrading treatment. Although in the United States we're beginning, I think, to become more conscious conscious of um, prison conditions and how they are torturous or inhumane and degrading, uh, inhumane and degrading, keeping someone for 25 hours or 23 hours a day in a cell. Um, it has significant impact. Nevertheless, um, it hasn't in the United States met the threshold um, to violate um, the constitutional prohibition on uh, cruel and unusual punishment, which is specifically outlawed under the Constitution. So, Just very, yeah. So, uh, can we test it down to uh, define to what extent the punishment would be considered as cruel? Like, like, we had this three-strong test yeah. of freedom of So, <laughs> what we get under this Belgium case, uh, and then from the other, is they do, they, they, they say essentially that it, there's no exact, it's sort of the, um, we have to take a look at the overall question. So it looks at duration, sex, severity, impact, all of that helps us in the case of torture, it's also about purpose, do you see what I mean? So we have to analyze sort of the whole situation. It's not, this is, that, I mean, certain things that, you know, um, you know pulling someone's arm back, I and mean, that, 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 you know, that, that could be, clearly torture, right? Um, but again, it has to be taken on a case-by-case -case, uh, instance, looking at, again, sex, age, um, the physical uh, well-being of the individual, for instance, um, the physical effects, the mental effects, and so on. We know torture um, ha has a pretty high bar. There's a lower bar for inhumane and degrading treatment. Again, it doesn't have that intentional element, um, but it also takes into account the physical and mental uh, effects, the age, and so on. Intentional in that I'm using this, I'm torturing you, I'm doing this to extract information from you, right? Is usually what it is. Or uh, the police are doing it as a way of exacting revenge on you. You see what I mean? Whereas inhumane and degrading treatment oftentimes happens more through recklessness or through negligence. That is, prison conditions are bad, right? Um, again, no, no toilet, no running water, uh, disease rampant. Again, they may not be doing that intentionally, uh, or to get information from you, or to get revenge, but there's just, they don't care. You see what I mean by that? The, the, sort of that difference. So again, it doesn't just protect the right not to be tortured, but it allows you, it prevents you also from being put in conditions that are inhumane or degrading, is the, um, is the idea. Do you see that difference? So a lot of countries, like, is it, is it uh, humane to uh, torture terrorists to extract information? 
Speech. No, torture is never allowed. Never allowed. So it's not a question of justifying whether torture is allowed or not. It's a question of making the determination, is this torture? So imagine, for example, a police officer takes a 35-year-old uh, man or woman uh, and says, you know, I'll be back when I'm ready. You know, you're not getting any water until you talk to me. That's not going to be torture. But imagine you have a five-year-old kid and you say, you know, son, you're not getting any food, your parents uh, you know, they're gonna, I'm gonna kill them if this happens and so on. That becomes torture, right? Because, again, it's perhaps, you know, denying a 35-year-old water, let's say. Well, that in itself is, is, not, uh, is not torture. But doing the same, the same thing to a child could be torture. Does everybody see the difference? So you have to look at what are the, sever the, the, the severe mental and physical effects that it has on someone. And to do that, you have to look at it in the context of age, sex, and physical and condition. Uh, and that will determine whether or not it's, it's torture or whether or not it doesn't meet that threshold. And the same thing in this case, in the Belgium case, again, had you taken an adult uh, and not let them call their, their wife, for example, or, their, uh, or you put them in a cell with other adults, that in itself is an inhumane and degrading treatment, right? But doing that to a 10-year-old girl whose mother is in Toronto, whose family is in the Congo, um, that is inhumane and degrading. Do you see what I mean? So it's really it's, it's a much more case-by-case -case basis taking into account the particularities of what causes um, something to be inhumane and degrading. Is that, is that clear? Okay. But any, uh, any final questions? Can I have two more minutes? Um, so people, a few people have asked me about how to get into the field of, um, of human rights. And uh, my, my, my advice is a few things. I think one is, um, while you're still college, while you're still young, um, you know, it, it's a question of building up and getting that experience. I mean, I think for me that is the most uh, essential. That is internships, internships, internships. I mean, if you can get those internships, uh, I think it's essential. Think about it also what type of organization you want to work for. What you want to work for is a local uh, organization in, in Bihar, for example. Well, then you might want to network and, and connect with organizations there because the issues there are different than the issues um, you know, in, at the international level, for example, right? Um, uh, or the people that you need to know there are different from the people that you need to know if you want to end up at the United Nations, for instance. So um, really give some thought to where you want to end up um, and then think of it as a chessboard, kind of. What do I need to do to get there? Do I need to network, for example, in, 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 in Delhi or do I want to try and um, you know, get into UN offices, uh, UNICEF's office and so on and do an internship there, right? Because that may be more connections, that may be the skills I use. So that, that I think is one thing. Also, think a little bit about what area of human rights interests you. Um, uh, you don't find people who work in all areas of human rights, right? I mean, it, it, you, you need to know uh, a lot about human rights, but it's also good to have some area of specialty, whether it's women's rights, whether it's access to justice, whether it's children's rights. So while you're here and, and, and studying, try and develop some sort of expertise. Take on research projects, um, take on, uh, you can do, uh, you know, look online, uh, connect with organizations where you can perhaps help out internship in that specific field. The other thing is also think about geographic location. Again, you, you need to know generally, but also think about, uh, you know, do I want to work in Latin America? Do I want to work in South Asia? Um, and, and that way you can also, again, think about the types of organizations you want and develop a specialty area within that region. Because again, the, the, the issues that are happening in, um, in India are not the same as the issues that are happening in, uh, in the US. There are human rights violations in both places, but the circumstances are different. The other thing I would suggest is um, try and develop some language skills. Uh, English is obviously important. Again, if you're going to work in India, then I guess uh, English and Hindi no, are, are the two essential languages. But if you want to work at an international level, I do think it is important to have one additional language. Um, what language is that? The French will tell you French. Um, and you know, French is, is important, again, within the United Nations. but. Again, if you want to work in Latin America, well, then you need Spanish, right? If you want to work, um, you know, in uh, uh, Europe, you know, in Europe, well, certainly English, and then uh, ideally one other language, you no, know, the language of the country. So, again, you need to think a little bit uh, about the language requirements. In your case, I mean, you have English, which obviously is, is a huge uh, advantage. Uh, I usually talk about this when I, with Spanish students who don't always have that, that, and it is essential, obviously, that they gain. At least um, English. No, uh, so think about all those issues, um, and then you know, the most important thing for me is networking. Um, network, network, network. Every chance you get, <coughs> try and meet people who work in this field. Um, you know, go to events if they have them at your law schools. Uh, when you're in Delhi, try and visit. Uh, you know, uh, the UNICEF office or the UN Women office. Just say you want to go there for an informational meeting. See if you can meet someone. Um, I think all of that adds up and, and helps. Again, it's not one thing or another. 
but it, it is many things. And I, another thing that I think, again, if you want to get into international human rights, um, <coughs> is try and go abroad. Uh, again, it's not always easy. Uh, there are financial implications there. But if you can get an internship in another in another country, uh, whether it be in Africa, that was it. If you want to work in Africa, then well, English or French or, or Portuguese, no. Um, but um, you know, if you can get some field experience, because I think particularly international organizations like people with, with field experience, uh, people who are on the ground, people who are able to work uh, in, in, in different environments, um, so, and that have this yeah, multicultural adapta ad adaptation ability. So if you are, you know, if you can do it, I would certainly um, recommend it. But for me, I, networking. I mean, again, getting that good foundation, getting experience, but not sitting passively, or going out of your way to try and um, to try and get that experience. The other thing that I think is important, although it's not necessary, but it could help you, is doing an LLM uh, in human rights law or in a related field. Um, I don't know in India which are which where LLMs are for for human rights or those, but certainly uh, in the United States we have the big universities um, you know, like like Columbia University and, and so on, which have very strong programs in, in, in human rights or in related areas in Europe uh, as well. I think the best area to go for human rights uh, is either the Netherlands or uh, or the UK. Uh, Geneva as well, Switzerland has some programs, but I, I do think that the best programs are in the UK or in um, in, in the Netherlands, particularly for, there you can do children's rights, uh, there's quite a host of programs. Uh, and the other thing is when you think about where to do an LLM, think about it also in terms of the opportunities that are near. Um, you know, there are some great universities in, 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 in yeah, let's say in, in, in certain cities around the world or certain villages around the world, um, but you want to go to a place where there are internships, and that's probably why I think the UK is so good because there are so many human rights organizations in London, for instance, where you can do internships, you can make those connections. Um, you could do it in a place like Exeter, for example, no? which, which again, is you're in England, I mean, there are opportunities, but those organizations uh, are, are based in London, right? So you want to go to a place where um, you can find those. Uh, and you know, on a final note, uh, again, this is our last class. And I hope everyone enjoyed it. I certainly, I love teaching here. It was a fantastic opportunity, uh, an opportunity that I will always uh, remember. And hopefully for you, uh, you know, it gave you a strong understanding of the complexity of human rights. That just because at the UN level we have this, this, and this, um, we have to really pay attention to countries, their contexts, their histories, uh, and other factors um, that uh, in some cases justify uh, a difference in human rights application, uh, but uh, in some cases uh, don't, as we can see through the jurisprudence of the European court and the uh, U.S. court. And hopefully it also gave you a system of how those courts function uh, from a U.S. perspective and a, a European perspective. Uh, and hopefully more than anything, it, it sparked your interest in, in human rights, human rights protection. Because at the end of the day, we can talk about these cases in these abstract terms, but human rights is about protecting human dignity. Uh, and making sure that um, that everyone, but particularly the voiceless and the marginalized, um, have a voice. And uh, you know, it takes uh, it takes smart people like yourselves, people with education, with ability, um, to really make sure that those human rights are, are protected. So uh, again, thanks for this opportunity uh, to Kavita and, and to Benita, and more than anything, thanks for you for signing up. Because if you didn't sign up, we won't have this class. Um, so uh, again, it was, a, it was a pleasure. If any of you are in Spain, uh, you have my email. Shoot me an email. Uh, if any of you need advice, you need assistance, uh, obviously you can count on me uh, for that. Just last question. Yeah, I think we're really late with this, but yesterday uh, you signed up saying that the dollar bill. Uh, says, uh, in God we talked about it at the beginning of class. Yeah. Yeah. He also wanted to do something if you can answer. We discussed it. Because it's great to protect the... I mean, how much it is it is important to protect the rights of the criminals in the case? I think it's extremely important. I mean, they are humans. Uh, unless it's a dog committing the crime. No, um, no, as long as it's a human, I mean, humans, I mean, that, that is the idea of human rights, is that, you know, in, in a case, even in a, in a terrible case of rape, gang rape, they're humans and they have rights and this is precisely what human rights are for. Um, you know, human rights protect us, but most of us probably don't need that much human rights protection. Um, that, that person who has committed a crime, who may be poor, who may not have access to a lawyer, who may not know his or her rights, that's the person that human rights has to come so into play. So human rights laws are like, uh, can I say, biased uh, in favor of accused and uh, if we say accused and victims, they're biased, they're biased, I mean, biased just for the accused. They you don't think of human standard. rights are victims. Yeah, I mean, you can't victimize a criminal just because they are a criminal, no, no, right? No, 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 not that. But you cannot victimize the victim only because she's a victim. No, no, no. But I don't know that giving someone a fair I, trial... On the pretext of human rights of accused. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, but again, I, I, the idea is that it's an even playing... Anyway.
Uh, if you want, I can ask you a question uh, later. Okay, very good. So that's it for me. Uh, I'll see you guys probably for the exam tomorrow. Uh, well, why don't we do a selfie while we're all here? No? Shall we do a selfie? Well, I'll do it if you don't mind. I don't know if we're going to get it wrong, but... <laughs> there. Wait, uh, maybe we can do it like this, hold on. Like this? Don't leave any of us out. No. All of us No, it won't work. Hold on. Should we okay. move behind you there? Rally behind you? No, nah, just some of you. We'll get the picture. It's a selfie stick now. He's good with selfies, nah? He knows how to take it. Oh, from all sides. Oh. Okay. Okay. So, so we all are there. You're all there. Okay, good. Adam. All right, I'll see you all there. Um, wonderful.